Yes. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Drago's uh, virtual ICS conference, co-sponsored by the Energy Intel Group, the EIG. Uh, I think it's morning for, for most of us. Um, for those uh, still logging on or whatever, we'll, we'll get underway in a, in a few minutes, so, so don't panic. Before we get started though, I'd, I'd just like to let everyone know that presentation, presentations will be recorded uh, and the recordings will be sent out in a few days, so they'll be readily available for you. Uh, please submit any questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of the, your Zoom screen. Um, and unlike normal conferences, feel free to have any outrageous um, mobile ringtones you like on your phone because we won't hear that. Uh, and of course, you, you know where the exits are and you know where your toilets are because um, you're, all, uh, you're all at home. So I'm Warren Meikle. I'm part of the relatively new Dragos Australia team. Um, I'm the sole East Coaster. Uh, the rest of my colleagues are over in Perth. So I'm, I'm in lockdown Melbourne. So if you do need to, uh, to contact me, you know where I am. I'm not going anywhere for the next uh, five weeks or so. Um, so I think with that, we can probably get underway. So I'd like to um, just do a quick run through the agenda today. We've got four excellent speakers for you. Um, one of which uh, I'm proud to say is um, our very own Julian uh, from the Australian team. So he'll be along last. So also like to uh, take the opportunity to introduce Ben May from the Energy Intel Group. And uh, Ben, I think you've got a few words to say. Yeah, thanks, Warren. So um, I thought I'd uh, just get the opportunity to give a bit of an overview around the Energy Intel Group for those that um, haven't been exposed to it or aren't part of it at the moment. So um, I might just jump to the next slide if I can. So um, I, uh, for those who don't know me, my name's Ben May and I work for uh, AML, or the Australian Energy Market Operator. Uh, and I work uh, within the, the Cyber Threat Operations team as the manager there. Um, and uh, effectively, several years ago, um, we started to work with other energy participant organisations within Australia, uh, operationally, and uh, from that, we, we spawned out uh, over the years, effectively, some mailing lists and communication channels, uh, and from there, formed out uh, a group which consists primarily of uh, people working within or using ICS, working in the energy industry, or have an interest in, uh, in operational technology. So um, we really positioned the group and tried to draw members in from an operational level, um, whereas we've seen a lot of other groups at the time uh, were more aimed at management level and having that interaction around sort of uh, strategy and planning. And, uh, and really, we wanted to try and get as many people at the coalface in uh, as possible. So it's a, it's a, really, uh, a really good number of, of people that we have at the moment and effectively we're always looking for, for new members that may find uh, or get value from the group as well. So um, we do have a, a vetting process and effectively um, if, if you do have anyone that would be interested in joining or would like or you would like to join yourself, um, please feel free to, to reach out and email uh, admin at energyintelgroup.com and I think we've got that up as the next slide anyway. So uh, when the presentations are sent out, you should be able to get those contact details there to, to reach out. Um, and uh, we can look to, to give you some details around the group and, and some of the meetings that we hold or some of the, uh, the regular communication channels that we uh, maintain. And, uh, and from there, we can look to incorporate uh, you into one of the groups there that we, uh, we run. But um, I'll, uh, I'll look to hand back to the Dragos guys and uh, let everyone uh, enjoy the, uh, the presentation. That's great. Thanks, Ben. Um, before we uh, launch into our first speaker, uh, I just thought I'd just paint a, a rough overall picture, roughly uh, half hour blocks for, for each of the speakers. And we're looking at uh, potentially um, 20 minutes or so of talk with some uh, Q&A time of about 10 minutes at the end of each one. So that's the, the rough plan. Uh, of course, uh, we'll try and stick to that as best we can. So the first speaker uh, is Austin Scott. Austin works as a principal industrial pen tester for us uh, out of Canada and has been in the industry for 18 years. So Austin's published three books on PLC programming. He's worked with many ICS environments, including oil and gas, the electric grid, manufacturing, and water. 
So Austin is the recipient of the SANS Cybersecurity Difference Maker Award and a DEF CON black badge. So today Austin's going to talk um, on simple wins during slowdown. And uh, without further ado, Austin, over to you. Thank you so much, Warren. Uh, so I wanted to talk today about uh, some things that can be done during a downturn. And it's really based on uh, our experience uh, doing uh, assessments and penetration testing within ICS environments. And it's uh, largely based off of our uh, 2019 year in review based on our uh, assessment findings there. Next slide, please. We can skip that one too. Next slide. Thank you. So in our uh, 2019 findings, uh, we, we noticed a lot of patterns uh, during our assessment, things that we saw over and over again. And uh, in today's presentation, I'm gonna talk about five ways of addressing some of these common findings. Uh, it's a very pragmatic approach to uh, reducing risk in your ICS environment. Doing these five things doesn't make a bulletproof, complete industrial cybersecurity program, but it will reduce your risk. And uh, from my perspective, and uh, the way I would define risk uh, from my uh, penetration testing background is anything that makes it more difficult for the adversary to move laterally or escalate privilege in your environment. So what we saw in 2019 uh, was there was uh, typically very limited visibility into the ICS networks. There was often a lack of separation between uh, IT and OT uh, user groups. Uh, we often found we were unable to be detected during our red team or penetration tests. And uh, we often found there were lots of shared credentials laying around these networks and uh, credentials were easy to access and leverage. Uh, we found there were almost always routable network connections between the IT and the operational environment, even in cases where the customer claimed that there was an air gap in place. Uh, and often we'd find poor security parameters, lots of firewall rule issues and uh, uh, lots of interactive protocol or temporary rules in those firewalls that, that made it pretty easy for us to traverse between IT and OT environments. And uh, we did find uh, assets that were directly connected to the internet or uh, just one hop away from the internet through a cell modem or other devices like that. Uh, next slide, please. Now, before we dive into some of the recommendations I have, uh, what it's important to take a, a threat based approach. It's, it's important to understand uh, the adversaries that are targeting your industry and uh, understand the, uh, the techniques and tactics that they might leverage against your team. Uh, within Dragos, we, we typically simulate and emulate tactics of different activity groups under our own internal group we call Kyberite. Uh, so a lot of the, the techniques that we leverage and, and we'll be talking about are, uh, are things that, uh, that we use as we're working through a network. Uh, and a lot of the tools that I'll be describing and recommending are the same tools that we use, as well as the same tools that other adversary groups will use in your ICS network. Next slide, please. So it's, uh, it's important to understand that your environment plays a huge role in the tactics, techniques, and procedures used by an adversary. Um, I mean, we track TTPs, and we've got uh, things like a uh, MITRE attack for ICS and, and MITRE attack for enterprise that uh, document a lot of the tactics and techniques leveraged by these activity groups. But it, it's important to remember that their tactics and te techniques will change depending on the environment they're faced with. Uh, so it's important for you to evaluate your own environment and uh, understand how an adversary might see things differently or what they might leverage to move laterally or escalate privilege. They're not always gonna play the same playbook, although they, they do have uh, some preferred tools that they would use and techniques. Uh, but depending on what you have and what ports you have open, 
these techniques will change. So the environment uh, does play a big role and not uh, every cybersecurity recommendation is applicable to uh, everyone's environment. Next slide, please. So we're gonna talk about these top five ICS findings in, uh, in 2019. Uh, number one is, is firewall rule issues. Number two is general access management issues. Number three is system hardening. Number four is, is logging. And number five is network visibility. Next slide, please. So we'll start off talking about ICS firewall rules. Uh, so during our assessments, one of the uh, common uh, things we'll do is, uh, is uh, evaluate the firewall rules. And uh, we can do this either um, by uh, looking for holes in the network, the old fashioned way by uh, trying to uh, uh, send packets through or by getting a copy of the network firewall rules and, and doing an assessment on them. Uh, so oftentimes we have limited time and resources during uh, these engagements. And uh, it makes sense to take more of a white box approach where this information is shared. As a defender, certainly uh, you have the advantage uh, because you have access to your own firewall rules, you can easily review and monitor them for changes. So we highly recommend that uh, you do that. Uh, what we often see is uh, between the IT and the ICS network, a lot of temporary firewall rules can be found. Things that were put in place during commissioning of a control system that were meant to be removed uh, that can often lead to pivoting across the network or uh, remote access into the ICS, uh, or there's often vendor solution dictated rules for their remote access or, or vendor access rules that they've put in place that you may not really be aware of. So it's a good idea to um, take a look at your perimeter between your corporate and ICS environment and really uh, try to understand what each rule is doing and, and if, it's been, if it has been justified. So when I'm doing a review on a firewall, uh, it's great to use a tool that speeds things up. There are some commercial tools available like Nipper, but uh, there's a great tool that's free that I highly recommend from SolarWinds called their uh, SolarWinds Firewall Browser. And it can read firewall rules from a number of different vendors and allow you to uh, quickly read through them as if you would read through an Excel spreadsheet. So it, it puts it into a nice data table format and allows you to go line by line in a uh, a much more palatable manner. So what you're looking for when you're doing this internal firewall rule is uh, interactive protocols uh, and things that would allow an adversary to pivot between networks. So interactive protocols are things like SSH, remote desktop, VNC, um, SMB. I'd even include things like HTTP in that list. So anything that could potentially lead to remote command execution or remote access. And uh, you want to understand what interactive protocols are moving between your environments and, uh, and ensure that you're, you're monitoring these or uh, ensure that they're justified, that, that um, you know why those exist. And uh, if there's not a good reason for them, then just remove them. Um, and if you're not sure, just remove them and uh, see if someone complains. Uh, I know that's not always the best approach, but sometimes uh, sometimes that can uh, that can get the desired result. Next slide, please. So the firewall browser demo. I wanted to just show a quick screenshot of what it looks like when you're running the SolarWinds firewall browser tool, and we can see we've got some source uh, networks with their destination and, and services that are allowed, and we can see uh, a couple things. We might want to look at like 3389, uh, as some of you may recognize, as remote desktop uh, protocol. So um, you'd want to understand why this exists and, um, and figure out if, if that's uh, necessary or not. Next slide, please. So the next thing we want to talk about is access management. And it's a pretty broad category of uh, vulnerability or issue, but from what we've seen, uh, there's, there's typically uh, a lot of domain 
environments, Active Directory environments within ICS these days, which is a good thing. Active Directory does have a lot of security features, which are beneficial and does <laughs> risk. Uh, but uh, we find that these Active Directory environments within ICS are poorly maintained and uh, often way overprivileged. Like almost everybody in a lot of the domain admin areas we see is running as a domain admin. And uh, once uh, an adversary gets into that environment, they will quickly uh, tear it to pieces. Um, so what can you do about that? How can you identify this issue in your environment? Um, well, what, what we do as a penetration testing team and what adversaries would also use is a tool called Bloodhound. And it's a free open source tool. And it's actually relatively safe to run in an ICS environment because it primarily interrogates your uh, Active Directory environment. It, it will only send packets to your AD server uh, and nothing else. So and this is the, the type of traffic that happens every day anyway, so it shouldn't cause any disruptions to an operating plant. But uh, it's able to unwind the spaghetti mess that is Active Directory. Active Directory for years has sort of enjoyed this security through obscurity because it was really hard to unravel the groups and groups and all the different domain uh, permissions and uh, uh, privileges and how they're wound together and the implications of, of uh, this complex environment. But uh, Bloodhound uses graph theory to, uh, to graphically represent these relationships and uh, identifies paths from the average user right up to domain admin. So it's a, a very quick method of identifying uh, vulnerabilities in your Active Directory configuration. Uh, next slide, please. So here's an example of what Bloodhound looks like in action. As you can see that it's using the GraphQL type database to show these uh, relationships. Uh, here we have uh, this RTAM user who is a member of this admin group who admins this server. And uh, the same server has a session of a domain admin. So if we were to compromise this server, uh, this app01.labs server, uh, we could get the password for that domain admin and then gain domain admin rights over that server. So uh, it, it's actually quite easy to use and, and fairly safe to use in ICS environments. And it's something that it doesn't take very much time and, and just running it and understanding that risk can make a huge difference in your uh, security posture from uh, the uh, perspective of an attacker. Because as you know, once you gain domain admin, uh, that adversary can basically do whatever they want in your network. Next slide, please. So access management part two. So of course there are environments that don't have Active Directory environments, or uh, there are other scenarios where uh, credentials are used that aren't controlled by AD. And what we commonly find is just passwords laying around the network. Um, we find credentials aren't properly managed using a, a vault or they're not properly encrypted. We find a lot of passwords as you may expect in like Excel spreadsheets or notepad files or, or things like that laying around. We also find passwords in uh, places like the Windows registry. Um, or on the local file system uh, because whenever you use tools that allow you to save that password in that tool, it's awfully convenient to do that because you don't have to type in your password every time. But when you do that, these programs don't always secure that password very well. So programs like VNC, programs like PuTTY, uh, programs like Batch Patch, these, uh, these store credentials in an unsafe manner that make it pretty trivial for an attacker to decrypt them and then leverage them in your network. So uh, it, it's important to be aware of, of how and where you're storing your passwords because um, it's pretty trivial for an adversary to dump a bunch of these password scraping tools onto your endpoint and just uh, uh, pilfer them out. So I've uh, listed a few different password tools and we'll take a look at what that might look like uh, in the next slide, but things like Session Gopher, LSAS Dump, Mimi Cats, Mimi Kittens, uh, some of the these nurse soft tools. These are very commonly deployed as post exploitation tools by activity groups just for that purpose, uh, just to pull those passwords out of memory, pull those passwords out of the registry and, and the file system 
so that they can be reused uh, and um, can further their privilege escalation and lateral movement. Next slide, please. So uh, what we recommend is, um, you know, trying to pull passwords out of memory off of one of your non-critical ICS systems. Uh, so one thing you might want to do is um, open up the task manager and then just do a dump uh, from the uh, of the lsas.exe file, create that dump file and see if it generates an alert. See if you have any visibility into that. Next slide, please. And uh, once you have that dump file extracted, you can take that to another machine, like a Kali box or something that you have outside of your ICS network. And you can uh, dump all the passwords that are stored in memory. And this will give you a pretty good idea of if your local Windows system hardening is up to snuff, if you're seeing clear text passwords in that dump, then you need to make some changes to your Windows configuration so that it's not storing your clear text passwords in memory. Uh, some people may not be aware of this, but by default, when you log into most Windows boxes, that password does get stored uh, and it can be pulled out in the clear with the right tools and the right uh, level of access. So here's an example of Mimikatz actually doing that. Um, so Mimikatz, uh, it is uh, certainly malware, but it, it's, it's worth testing out, even just putting the executable on one of your non-critical servers just to see if it gets caught and to see what that alert looks like is a pretty worthy test. This is a tool that's, um, that's just so commonly used across different activity groups that uh, you should try it out and see what happens in your environment on a non-critical system, of course, but just to see if you can alert on it if you're if you're getting that um, feedback or events from in your SOC, if you have any visibility to this tool being used, because it's one of the first tools, one of the first post exploitation tools that we would use or uh, an adversary would use in your environment. Next slide, please. So here is uh, another tool that we listed on the previous slide called Session Gopher, and it's a handy tool that helps you pull other passwords out of the computer, like. WinSCP sessions or Chrome or Firefox passwords or Microsoft remote desktop credentials. So they'll um, provide some of these uh, helpful credentials to an adversary. So it's, it's good to be aware of what they might be able to see if they ran this tool on your endpoint. Uh, so it doesn't require you to, you to install anything, but uh, if you try this on a non-critical system and just see if you have any hits, it's worth, um, it's worth testing out uh, just to see if you're securely storing passwords or not. Uh, next slide, please. And again, these, this is very common tradecraft, very common tactics that we use successfully almost every, every uh, penetration test we do, uh, especially in the ICS space. The password management and the um, access management is so poor that we never really need to use exploits uh, because we can usually get domain or administrator passwords fairly quickly and then um, we uh, are able to do whatever we want in the environment. So protect those passwords, lock down your AD environments. Now system hardening. What we see is a lot of common hardening issues that allow for things like hash reflecting, passing of clear, uh, passing of hashes and clear text password recovery. Uh, and uh, it, it makes it very easy for us to move around, move laterally in the Windows environment and uh, escalate our privileges. And, and this is largely because a lot of uh, folks in the ICS community are, are afraid to make changes on the Windows systems they're worried that um, it may not be compatible with their vendors. Uh, so there is um, a general fear about system hardening and what that might, uh, how that might impact their SCADA or DCS system. Uh, so like any change, this has a, a medium operational risk. Uh, you will want to check with your vendor before you make some of these hardening changes to make sure it doesn't impact their SCADA or DCS or control system. Uh, but um, a lot of these are sort of backwards compatible, backwards compatibility features that are turned on by default that you don't really need and aren't likely used by your SCADA system. So turning those off actually makes it way harder for an adversary to move through your environment. Once you do a little basic hardening, it, uh, 
it really makes uh, a penetration tester's job a lot more difficult, as well as an adversary's job much more difficult. And it's, it's fairly trivial. Uh, there's lots of tools out there that will help you identify these hardening issues. Um, there's tools like the Sys tool, uh, the Microsoft Security Compliance tool that's free, uh, STIG tools out there. Those do require you to install some kind of executable. But uh, there's a PowerShell script called CHAPS by Cutaway Security um, that uh, it doesn't require you to install anything. And it, it, it is a trusted, um, he's a SANS instructor who wrote it. It's a trusted uh, tool, in my opinion. Uh, so you can, you can run that PowerShell script and even review the source code. It doesn't do anything too fancy, but it will check for common hardening issues and even uh, checks your event logging, which is another common issue we'll get into later on. Uh, so next slide, please. So here's a uh, chaps running. It's a PowerShell script. And uh, you can see that um, this is just a, a, a small uh, sample of its output, but it will, uh, it will identify a number of hardening issues in your environment. Next slide, please. Uh, and here's a little bit more information about some of the things that it looks for, like uh, looking for a W digest is disabled, LLMNR. A lot of these common attack vectors that are pretty easy to take advantage of if they are uh, if they're turned on in your environment um, and, and allow you allow attackers to pull passwords out of memory uh, fairly easily. So uh, locking some of these things down can be a, a huge improvement to your security posture. Next slide, please. Logging. So uh, there is a a very common issue across the board on the ICS systems that we evaluate. Uh, and, and that issue is around Windows event logging. Uh, in most cases, there's a complete lack of Windows event logging. In other cases, they do have uh, Windows event logging enabled, but they're not collecting the right stuff. It hasn't been actually configured properly to collect um, events of value that would actually help you detect attackers. Uh, and uh, often we're seeing it's not being centrally managed or monitored. So uh, an attacker could tamper with the logs or clear them completely uh, to cover their tracks. So uh, what we certainly recommend is implementing centralized logging uh, and then validate your event logging, validate that you've got the configuration to capture the common types of attacks and techniques that are used by uh, activity groups targeting ICS environments. Uh, and uh, that chat tool can help you with that once again. And when you run that PowerShell script, uh, next slide, please. It will actually tell you uh, what, what uh, uh, the recommended event monitoring is and will tell you if you have that turned on or not on that endpoint. So it's a nice checklist method of, of validating your security on the, uh, on your endpoints there to see if you're if you're collecting the right kind of data that could help you in an incident response case or uh, to detect uh, enemies or detect adversaries in real time and even with threat hunting if you're uh, if you're kicking off a threat hunting activity having that that uh, that centrally collected and uh, properly um, configured event monitoring uh, can be a huge benefit and it can save a lot of time in incident response to have that uh, centrally managed, centrally uh, collected event logging. Next slide, please. So network visibility. Now this is uh, another common issue that we see. Um, often we're able to, often we're able to operate within these ICS environments without being detected, without setting off any alarm bells, and uh, often we can be as loud as we want. Uh, and uh, no one will bat an eye or even notice what we're doing in the network. Uh, so having some network visibility into your environment, uh, understanding what your assets are can go a long way to help defend your network in, uh, and, uh, and support activities like threat hunting and incident response when, uh, when those do come up. So what you need to do uh, is identify places where you might collect this traffic. Uh, ideally, you'd use a tap um, or install a permanent tap that you could uh, 
you can tie into, even if you don't use it all the time, at least identify those locations where you need to collect the information and have something sitting there that you can quickly access. So if there is an incident, uh, or if you do a threat hunting exercise or something, you know where to plug into safely, uh, and you um, can start to collect that traffic right away. Otherwise, it can take a long time to, uh, to look at network diagrams, figure out the right uh, connection points that you need. So it's good to have that prepared ahead of time. So that's step one. Uh, and number two is create that procedure for collecting network packet captures. Um, and once you have that procedure, once you've tested that out and started to look at your data, you can start to use some free tools out there uh, like Network Miner or even Wireshark just to look at what that traffic flow contains, what kind of protocols are in there, or to visualize that to, to understand what assets are on your network really. Um, now there are some, uh, uh, a number of uh, tools out there. Uh, Dragos has a, a few community tools and then their commercial, our commercial Dragos platform that uh, provides network visibility. Next slide, please. So we, um, we did release two free tools that uh, can uh, provide visibility. And it's a good starting point, you know, when you're trying to figure out if you have the resources to support network visibility, just like any cybersecurity control, uh, just buying that box and sitting it out there, it's not going to help protect your environment. You need to make sure you, you can properly resource these tools and configure them and monitor them. Otherwise, it's a waste of uh, money and, and uh, we'll just, um, uh, it, it takes a lot of resources that could be spent in other areas that might actually reduce your risk. So you got to make sure you're ready uh, to do this. And this is a good way of testing that out using uh, downloading CyberLens and setting that up. CyberLens is a great tool for uh, ana analyzing uh, PCAPs, right? Uh, whereas Sophia is more of a continuous asset identification, asset monitoring tool. So uh, you could plug Sophia in and um, continuously monitor your network and see if you get value out of it. See if your um, if you can uh, uh, get resources behind it. Uh, and uh, if you really see the value, then you may want to consider moving to a commercial product. Uh, next slide here. And I feel um, Dragos at the end of the day is a software company and uh, I should mention we do have the Dragos platform, which takes things a step further when you're really ready to get serious about network visibility. Uh, Dragos takes a um, asset identification and anomaly detection, a threat based approach. Uh, to your OT network and it can do things like vulnerability identification and, and things like that. So um, once you're ready for that, that um, uh, network visibility, it's definitely a good option for you. But it's good to start, start slow, start with just identifying where you might plug that in, grab some PCAPs, making sure you can do that, making sure that you have the ability to collect uh, packet captures from your network is extremely important, especially if there's an incident or uh, you want to do a threat hunt exercise. Uh, so it's something to consider to, that uh, you should be uh, prepared for. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, these things, uh, they don't make a cybersecurity program for you. It's, it's not the end all be all, but it does make things more difficult for the adversary. And at the end of the day, I think that that means a lot. Anything that can slow down the adversary, that can make them work harder, that can make them do things they wouldn't normally do that's outside of their playbook, uh, will, um, will make them noisier on your, on your network. It will give you uh, uh, more dwell time uh, and uh, more um, opportunities to detect them and stop them. So, it's something that, that should be done uh, on a regular basis. Taking ownership and understanding your cyber risk in your environment can go a long way. Uh, and this is something I'd recommend people do before you engage uh, a professional services team like, like Dragos to do a pen test or architecture assessment of your ICS environment. Just go and, and knock off some of the, the very basic uh, vulnerability management type issues and uh, hardening issues and firewall issues. Uh, if, you, if you take care of the low hanging fruit, you'll get a lot more benefit out of um, a pen test or a red team or an ICS assessment of some kind 
uh, because the, the assessment team that comes in, they won't be focused on that low hanging fruit. Uh, that won't be consuming their time or their reporting time. They'll be able to look at the more interesting problems, the more challenging uh, uh, vulnerabilities in your environment. And that can really help reduce your uh, cyber risk and, and get some real benefit uh, out of um, that uh, assessment. Next slide, please. And it's something that should be done regularly. These environments are quite dynamic and they change uh, all the time. So it's something that once you start taking ownership of understanding your cyber risk in uh, the ICS environment, it's something that you should do on an annual basis or, or even more frequently. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. A lot of these things, you, could, you can hammer them out in a couple of days once you have the tools ready and you uh, understand how to use them or, or write those procedures. This can be done regularly and uh, actually can provide a lot of benefit. And uh, next slide, please. I believe that is the end. Yes, thank you. And we had some questions pop up there. Let me take a look at what we've got here. Uh, gotta love the scream test. <laughs> uh, most vendors have some security guidance for hardening within supported vendor comp compliance. Yes, yeah, uh, most vendors do have hardening guides. Uh, so it's good to use that as a reference, but uh, they are by no means the end all and be all of system hardening. There may be some things that you want to look at beyond what uh, they provide. And not every vendor uh, has those hardening guides. A few years ago, I, I went about trying to collect as many of those hardening guides as I could uh, when I was working at Shell. And uh, there was a lot of companies that didn't have them uh, a few years ago. So uh, it's something to definitely implement if you have the opportunity and it's something you should ask for if you are uh, getting a new greenfield deployment or updating a brownfield site um, you should ensure that the vendor is actually implementing their hardening guide because often what we find is if you don't ask for security if you don't tell them explicitly what you want for industrial cybersecurity, if you don't have standards or or practices or procedures that that you follow then they won't implement them. So you want to make sure you ask for the deal to get the deal. Ask for that cybersecurity. Make sure that your vendors are uh, applying their security best practices when they are deploying projects for you. Uh, next question here. Any recommendations on means to forward logs from segregated network to centralized logging? Example, logs, log stash. So, um, so Windows event forwarding is, uh, is capable of doing that and it's free built into um, the Windows platform. So you, you're able to um, uh, have uh, event, you can configure Windows event forwarding to bounce it between different servers. So it can go, it can collect it into a central location uh, within your ICS and then push that to a server, uh, some computer in your DMZ. And it could be a, a server that's tasked to do other things as well, like historian or, or other things. Uh, and then also have those events get forwarded to another um, uh, server in your corporate environment to, to move that, jump that through those trust zones. Uh, it's entirely possible just using built-in features of Windows. And of course, there's other tools out there that you could look at, like NX Log can do similar things, or uh, uh, Beats, WinBeats for Elasticsearch. Uh, and uh, you mentioned one here. Uh, log stash and things like that uh, do uh, can support some of the, I don't know about log stash, but there's, there are, there are a number of ways of moving those windows events in your environment. Um, and it's, it's just great to have them in one place when there's an incident, it's uh, saves you a lot of time to have all those windows events on one server somewhere. Uh, Cause you don't have to go digging around for them when you're doing an incident response. Uh, and of course, every minute counts when you're doing an IR engagement like that. So uh, what pen testing methodology do you use for legacy systems in the ICS space, which are sensitive in nature? Yeah, you, you really need to be careful when you're working on uh, legacy uh, machines, on, on really old machines uh, within the, uh, the networks. It's not uncommon for us to find these beige boxes laying around that have uh, Y2K compliance stickers and stuff on them, uh, even, even today. So. Uh, you got to be really careful with those things. They're fragile. If you look at them, they might they might fail, and then you'll never get parts for it again, and, and uh, you'll be in a, a difficult uh, situation for sure. So, um, <clears throat> uh, 
as far as pen testing those legacy systems, sometimes they're so old that they're actually secure because no one how, knows how to access them anymore when it's Windows NT and things like that. Uh, but uh, it's um, important to, um, to, to weigh the, the benefits of um, poking at these machines versus the cons or, or the downside of it. Uh, getting some kind of obsolescence plan in place where these machines will be migrated or updated over time uh, is, is the ultimate solution. But, uh, <coughs> pardon me, in the meantime, I, I would be very careful about running anything on them or, or uh, testing them that much. When you, when you encounter these deprecated systems, that's a finding. Uh, when you see XP or NT4, things like that, you call it out in your assessment. And um, beyond that, you call it as a critical or a high. And then, you know, we don't do much more testing on those uh, beyond that. Hey, uh, Austin, if I can just chime in there, uh, just on the Q&A tab. Uh, Gavin has asked, is Plumhound worth a shot in the ICS pen test released last month? And uh, Ali's also asked, what pen testing methodology you use for legacy systems in ICS space? So uh, we've covered that one off. So probably, um, if you just want to touch on Plumhound, if you think that's worth a shot. I am not familiar with uh, Plumhound. I'm familiar with uh, Bloodhound, but uh, not, that's, a, that's a new one for me. <laughs> Maybe that's a typo, Kevin. Um, so moving down, um, Chris Corbin, does uh, Drago's IR have a list of high value logs that they would expect to have on day one? Uh, would be good to have that list before an incident response to carve them out of the bulk for long-term storage. Yeah, we'll take what, what we can get <laughs> in general for Windows logs. It will, uh, it, it's uh, whatever you have, we're, we're able to ingest and, uh, and parse through pretty quickly. What we typically will do is take those event logs and, and load them into something like Elasticsearch so we can uh, start to make sense of that data. And, uh, and pull it in if you don't have your own sort of um, Splunk or uh, your own Elasticsearch uh, instance. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that's a good, good question. What we do, what we recommend is having that centralized logging of, uh, of your events and to follow best practices, like using things like uh, Sysmon uh, with your Windows event logging and enabling some of those advanced Windows event logging features uh, and ensuring those are configured properly using a tool like Chaps or the uh, Microsoft. Uh, uh, what is it? The Microsoft Security Compliance Toolkit is another good way of uh, of managing that. All right. Well, that's great. Thank you, Austin. Um, the uh, director's uh, waving at me. So um, thanks again. Our, our next. Um, I'll let you go. And our next talker is uh, Casey. So Casey's a senior adversary hunter on the Drago's Intel team, uh, experienced cyber threat Intel analyst, forensics analyst, and incident responder, and also uh, a US Army veteran. So um, over to you, Casey. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, my name is Casey Brooks. I will be uh, going over uh, adversary OSINT collection threats. Uh, as well as going over a brief case study. So next slide. Yep. Table of contents. Next slide. Next slide after that one. There we go. All right. Uh, so OSINT collection risk assessment. Um, this was developed uh, by myself and with Selena Larson and Amy Biglick. Uh and it essentially is a simple three by three uh, way to assess not only information that is put out by organizations uh, due to either policy or government requirements, but also just because they think that it's a good thing to have out there and how to assess it with adversary utilization uh, in their operations. So. The goal behind uh, assessing this risk is to one, uh, create the scenario behind 
the actual uh, reason for the OSINT having like a higher or lower risk score. So most times if you present a uh, case to take down some information due to adversaries being able to utilize it, they'll want to know why. And so this uh, will kind of lead you down the path of creating that case or that story to push forward to uh, remove the information. Now, uh, there's two really main things that we want to look at inside of uh, OSINT collection risk. Uh, one is the actual uh, information itself. We want to look at the quality of the information. If it has a relevance uh, based upon analytical assessment uh, of having a uh, a use to an adversary that could target your organization. Uh, some adversaries are very low level that some information will not be relevant to them. Some will be very advanced and they will be able to utilize the information a lot better or they are looking to, I'm sorry, not utilize it, but they're looking to collect it. It's of higher importance for them. And then on the other hand, we want to look at how an adversary utilizes it how easy is it to actually operationalize the information? The easier information is to operationalize, the easier it is for an enemy to or an adversary to plan around it. Uh, as an adversary plans around it, uh, it gives them a direction in which to go and creates a feasibility for their operations. Uh, in this feasibility, you're looking at return on investment, and if the information there indicates that uh, their ultimate intent or motivation to commit uh, a cyber attack is there, that you actually possess information um, that they want to collect, or you have uh, the means to actually access, or you have the means to access information is there. Um, the more difficult uh, information is to an adversary to utilize it, such as requiring highly technical uh, analytical efforts, or if it's a high complexity, or it just requires a long time, uh, uh, over time, a long-term collection effort, it, it may or may not be more important for an adversary. So uh, in this trend, we, we have typically observed that the harder the information is for an adversary to, uh, to operationalize, the less likely they are to go after and utilize it. Now, if it's of a high importance or it gives them a way to conduct an avenue of approach or a targeted attack, then it becomes much more um, valuable to them, even though it requires this high level analytical effort. Right. Uh, and again, looking at this, uh, the whole intention behind this is to keep it very simple. Uh, we use both a number system, one to three, as well as green, yellow, red, uh, to indicate the relative risk a, uh, to an organization. Not saying that anything in the green is uh, not risky, it's just it's less likely to be utilized or to be operationalized. All right, next slide. So, we're going to go over a case study about Xenotype accessing documents uh, and OSINT um, information from a victim in Australia uh, in the electric uh, sector. So uh, these are the three that we're going to go over. So next slide. So looking at this, um, this was a PDF that was hosted on a site that had uh, Nothing to, it was just freely hosted that anyone can download it. It wasn't tracked by any kind of um, kind of, you know, Kafka has made it very easy to automate collection for it. That's one of the things that you really want to look at defeating is automated collection. Uh, because the more time you make an adversary spend collecting information, the longer it is for them to want, uh, not only put it into a, a, an operational effect, but also it takes away the uh, return on investment from them because they're having to commit a large number of personnel hours or uh, invest in better technology.
technology to get past certain low-level defenses and flesh. So the system separation incident uh, was a very good way for an adversary uh, or this adversary that the Zeno Time adversary that collected it uh, to see an end-to-end -end summary of an incident and how the grid operators reacted to the unexpected stimulus. Now, this was very important to look at due to an adversary's planning methodology in that if to kind of avoid mirroring bias, but uh, if you can think of the scenario uh, to utilize this information to form a uh, an attack or to inform, um, give a, an adversary a better picture of what they want to attack, uh, then likely the adversary has also thought of it. Um, now, the potential value behind this is one that they can uh, observe how the actual grid reacts to an islanding event, uh, something that impacts uh, grid stability and can affect prices in the market. Now, the potential value to attackers is both one, economic, if they're looking to create any kind of uh, destabilization in the energy markets, as well as um, the, informing them of what the course of action uh, energy operators will take in the event of this happening. And now, while the event in this case was a natural causes as a weather event. Uh, if you, if an adversary can look at that and observe certain weather patterns, they can look for opportunities to combine a cyber event uh, with a weather incident, which would lead to longer recovery times uh, as well as misdirecting recovery efforts. Uh, and it also provides the opportunity to chain these in multiple places paired with knowing what the coordinated response is going to be uh, for the adversary to tailor their operations for maximum effect instead of a more push buttons here and there and see what happens approach. Next slide. Okay, so this was a trip of a to um, 275k old number one bus bar. Um, it essentially provided an adversary, uh, an engineering diagram of the substation. Um, we already have seen numerous adversaries uh, target this, particularly um, uh, Alanite and Deb Alloy uh, have also gone after engineering diagrams. Uh, and what this enables an adversary to do is essentially plan their operation once they get inside the network because a lot of adversary operations once they get on the network they spend a lot of time getting to know the environment zeno time previously spent three to four years inside of an environment getting to know it and advancing into the uh, ot network and gathering more information there to understand how it works if they can pre-plan that, that cuts their time by a lot due to uh, not having the requirements to have the dwell time, to know what to do inside the environment so they don't trigger anything they're not supposed to. But overall, it is essentially providing them a free map to interact with uh, the actual uh, engineering station. Um, now, Victims of the Trisis malware attack um, did not consider a cyber event to be the cause of the initial ground time. Now, an adversary with the information from this can replicate an incident and continuously uh, avoid detection or even consideration that a cyber event is going on. Now, uh, attackers can seize upon this mindset leading to longer downtime, as well as creating more of an economic impact or uh, a significant trigger of events and still continuously do. So 
uh, this was a CSV that had a list of generation stations and renewables uh, in the Australian grid system, uh, along with latitude longitude locations and everything. And at first, a lot of we, we kind of assessed that, like, could this really be used? It, it, I mean, anyone can find it on uh, line or look it up. Uh, but it also included the amount of possible power generation, ramp up and ramp down numbers, and field type that basically provided the uh, attackers to actually create uh, attack scenarios that are more plausible because they can look at incorporating this information um, to create an attack model or uh, plan out a full scenario uh, and create like a target package or something of that nature where they can then present it as an option to whoever the adversary customer is uh, to initiate an operation and therefore it cuts down on their uh, really their flash to bang ratio between their reconnaissance effort to actually delivering effects into uh, or onto a victory. Next slide. So as we uh, assess these documents, there was other um, there was other documents that were also collected uh, aside from those, uh, and we also looked at additional information that was provided uh, that an adversary could utilize. Now we looked at these um, documents, and at first we're like, okay, this is how an adversary could utilize them. These are the risks that we're associating with it. And then we advise the victim that, okay, this is our best recommendation. Uh, this information should either be placed behind something that you can track so you know uh, if there's a concerted effort by an adversary to collect this information, uh, you can get visibility um, on the actual download rates, like see if there's a, a, suddenly a spike in collection of this information. And overall, what these are, what this information provides to the ad city. Um, go to the next slide. And one of the things we also looked at was that not all the information that is provided is actually useful to an adversary. Um, there's a habit in um, cyber threat intelligence is to basically level label everything like a three or a high. And so everything's the same, but uh, being realistic about this, there was a lot of information that the adversary looked at that really didn't provide them much uh, relevance in conducting a cyber attack, as well as didn't really, at least in most attack calls, didn't really satisfy any kind of intelligence need that uh, wasn't readily available. Um, next slide. So our assessment when, uh, Zero time actually conducted this operation. Uh, if they were targeting an organization like AMO, uh, related to energy production, energy production facility locations, um, they would enable targeting for attacks. They could predict uh, defender responses uh, if this information was available to them. Um, and that was sort of kind of the reason that uh, I really want to put this together is show that um, adversaries can actually look at information that others don't consider relevant or don't think to, especially in the case of either corporate policy or governmental policy. Uh, and there's not really a uh, reason for defenders to uh, present a case for redress, except in this case where you see an adversary actively collecting intelligence. Next slide. <laughs> All right, so in this, we also went through and gathered additional information that the adversary had yet to provide um, and found additional uh, sources of OSINT information. Uh, next slide. Uh, there was a real-time outages CSV. Um, we identify uh, for a, this CSV that showed real-time outages for Western Australia. Uh, the site provided a lot of information um, 
about causes of outages, which uh, and their remediation steps, which is very important for an adversary, especially around uh, planning for deception or obfuscation of their operations. Um, they can look at additional ways to conduct attacks, uh, give them a lot more target selection uh, and operational time windows that uh, can blend their uh, cyber attacks uh, towards natural events and uh, kind of get a lot of the uh, risk off of their attack being discovered, being blamed on a real world event while achieving a, their specific intended effect. All right, next slide. So there was a map visualizations page which uh, really showed um, how the inner or how the power was moving through uh, this part of Australia, uh, including information uh, for maximum demand and yields. Uh, and what we really want to point out is like by baselining this information over time, attackers could model their attacks off of what is going on in the real world. So they could look at the data or the data being pushed around and model out how a disruption here or disruption there can shift uh, the ramp up, ramp down, uh, and um, uh, discharge or shedding of uh, power can really impact a larger area, especially if there's an intended effect. Right. Next slide. So here are the, some of the attack scenarios that we were able to develop off of this OSINT information that was collected. Okay, next slide. All right, a disruption event. Uh, an attacker could recreate a frequency disruption event by, mimic, by mimicking the information that they collected uh, and use the visualization maps to find each hot point along that line. In this case, compromising a substation in, um, uh, sorry, Southwest Queensland or NNS regions could begin the replication of the event. Um, now, is this a plausible or possible scenario that would be based upon the threat landscape as well as the adversary you're dealing with? But overall, there is a possibility uh, that an adversary can do this. Now, additional modeling should be done in respect to these natural events uh, and whether a, an attacker could potentially uh, cause a similar uh, and each area of the operations and territory poses different uh, challenges and risks. Now, um, one of the other things that we looked at was dependent upon meteorology for the region, uh, you have to take considerations for hurricanes, thunderstorms, flooding, uh, anything of that nature. Uh, those major weather events should be modeled in with that uh, for their impact. Next slide. <clears throat> All right, now power price manipulation. This was another thing that we really uh, took a look at. During island events, power prices could fall or surge to abnormal levels. Um, incorporating the real time uh, outage data can assist in determining where applicable scenarios can be defined uh, for these attackers. Uh, so if they're interested in an economic impact, they can look at. Um, essentially knowing how much capacity and how quickly competitors could ramp up, ramp down in the region, uh, such as the details pulled from that generator.csv, is incredibly useful for um, this scenario. Uh, knowing businesses to target inside of these re uh, regions can also lead uh, to the next scenario we're going to talk about. Next slide. Tangent general targeting, um, or tangential targeting, sorry. Uh, companies are often, um, can often be used as a uh, secondary or tertiary, uh, or, to, or used to create a secondary or tertiary impact on actually the intended, intended target. These attacks aren't very common, but it can be looked at as a type of supply chain attack. Um, 
the information we analyzed, uh, we also looked at the mining and smelting uh, industrial sectors. And that portion of the area was um, heavily tar or uh, has a, a lot of aluminum smelters which are very, very sensitive to um, uh, power fluctuation. They require a, a large amount of stable power, which has also been an issue in Australia due to a push to renewables. By attacking this kind of interrelationship, Australia and the sun can be financially damaged uh, from these irregular surges as well as uh, abnormal spikes in pricing due to an adversary tampering. Um, now, you can also look at if there would be a relational a relationship impact uh, because of industrial sectors having t more tenuous relationships. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Okay. Now, recommendations. Um, in assessing this xenotime activity, uh, we really identified a lot of, not only that was specific to xenotime, but also to a diverse set of adversaries. You really want to enable monitoring and logging of indicators where possible to identify xenotime uh, reconnaissance activity, making sure that you go back and you review information uh, as new IOCs or new uh, intelligence reports come in. Um, you want to ensure that information about operations requires an authentication gateway to prevent automated scraping of web pages. This is a very easy way for adversaries to collect information. It doesn't cost them a lot of time or energy to, or anything like that to collect. Um, identify, uh, identify information collected by the adversary, assess its potential use for adversary operations, and document it for historical research. It's very important you document uh, what an adversary is collecting because while you may not see it being used immediately, it can be uh, implemented later on. Different sc attack scenarios can be utilized with that information that become more feasible as time goes on. And so you want to, if, if specific events keep happening and it involves those information uh, that an adversary is collecting, it raises the probability that it, an adversary can be involved. Now, you also want to model. Uh, you want to practice responses to these adversary actions and make sure that if an adversary is utilizing the, the information that you have is that you know how to plan, that your actual response plans can plan around that or that they incorporate the possibility that this adversary is using the information they've collected. Uh, one of the key points is that information like this should only be accessed by owner operators of electrical grid infrastructure. Um, this really, this information, even if it is required by you know law or public policy, should at least have an authentication gateway that can be tracked. Um, the historical information should be noted or attached. Um, especially if it involves the equipment that the adversary is uh, um, interacting with. All right, next slide. All right. So um, what, we ultimate, what we ultimately uh, looked at was that this xenotime uh, activity really was in the very initial stages of collection. Um, it was really, uh, it, we had seen it across multiple industrial verticals, but it was very specific to uh, this vehicle. Um, now, asset owners and operators should review public information uh, that could be relevant to an attacker, and also review your policies that could be a requirement or are a requirement uh, for public disclosure and actually determine if it's ne uh, necessary and if it is to go to executives or uh, corporate lawyers, whatever, and push for either a review if that necessity still exists or if it can be curtailed in a way that is more easily 
vulnerable and uh, less likely to be harvested by an adversary uh, through automated methods. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Casey. Let me just get myself sorted here. So let's have a look at the questions. Video is not working. Come on, there we are. So we've got a question here from Brody. Those with the skills to discover and analyze security flaws in ICS environments are, are not the owners of the assets. So how do we drive security culture in order to get asset owners to want to uplift security? Perhaps developing reports and scoring to promote healthy competition. Appreciate your input there, Casey. All right, uh, well, um, a lot of it has to do with cooperating with your asset owners and your business units, uh, as well as um, kind of creating a shared risk environment. Um, a lot of times uh, the SOC or uh, the intelligence element that is looking for adversaries uh, can do a better job of messaging to the asset owners uh, about these actual threats and essentially showing them the, the common threat landscape that the assets being targeted um, and making them want to defend it, showing, giving them examples that this adversary conducted this kind of attack. Uh, we match that footprint for that attack. We can, we are vulnerable to it. We have this type of equipment, or we share this kind of commonality in operation between a, another victim or something like that. Uh, the whole effort to uh, like create more reports to get people to change uh, usually isn't that effective because people don't want to read reports. Uh, creating a more succinct uh, like intelligence summary uh, and then building that up over time as well as the actual instance that you have in your environment, uh, showing them that the risk is there uh, is a lot better than just flat out being like, here's some reports, read them. Um, now you try to make your own reports and send them to me. It doesn't, that doesn't really generate that um, kind of initiative and drive to secure the environment. It usually makes people resentful or territorial for, especially in an IT or OT uh, network uh, in defending their environment. So uh, it, you wanna move toward a more cooperative stance instead of a competitive stance. Uh, re regardless that uh, of if a business unit is making a wrong or right decision in defending their environment, it should still be a, an effort by either the security personnel or the intelligence personnel to uh, form a cooperative partnership or provide them information that will make them more receptive to change as opposed to trying to make them, trying to force change. That makes sense. Yeah, I agree. You know, the, the, the Drago's mission is to safeguard civilization, but you know, everyone on this call uh, has a part to play in that, and uh, we have to do it collectively and, and together. So if uh, there are no more questions, oh, um, got another one from Brody. Not really a question, but a comment. I wonder how feasible a uh, AFLC ripple control attack would be. These signals have no integrity or confidentiality. Uh, an attacker could couple to a residential supply and inject off signals on all channels at say two kilowatts. I'm not sure how far the signal would reach at this power. It would probably result in at least a suburban street without any electric hot water after a couple of days. So um, yeah, as Tony Jones used to say on Q&A, Brody, uh, we'll, we'll take that as a comment. Um, Casey, thanks for the, uh, the Australian flavor uh, this morning as well. Um, your evening, I know. Um, so I think good time to go for a, just a short comfort break, five minutes. It's 9.45 on the East Coast. So I suggest we uh, pick it back up at uh, 9.50. So um, 
talk to everyone again soon and uh, Joe will be our next presenter. So see you in five minutes.
Hi everyone, welcome back. Our next speaker is Joe Slowick. And Joe is a threat intel and adversary hunter at, at Drago's, former an incident uh, responder at uh, LANL in the US, uh, the uh, Los Alamo National Laboratory, and is a former US Naval officer. He likes to think he's a prolific social media poster, as long as you don't mind risque memes and gifs. So uh, today's topic, uh, I'll let Joe cover rather than to repeat it. So um, Joe, please uh, feel free to take it away. Sure, will do. So we'll talk today about uh, ransomware, which not something that we typically would associate with industrial network operations, but we're starting to see an increasing trend line of ransomware or ransomware-like capability affecting not just industrial related organizations or companies, but also, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, potentially even getting into industrial control networks slide. So who am I? We had the brief introduction. So my name is Joe Slowick. I currently am a principal adversary hunter for Dragos, uh, former background in incident response as well as some other items and overall a focus now on threat intelligence uh, within the industrial control system space. Slide please. So our agenda today is that we'll have an overview of ransomware and then look into the different spreading mechanisms, such as worms and other items that have distributed ransomware over time, shift to industrial specific targeting and even in some very limited or primitive industrial targeting capabilities. And being reminded to start my video and locking up everything. Uh, and then talk about some interesting potential cases of state-sponsored ransomware and how this might serve or how this overall trend might serve as a cover for more interesting disruptive operations slide. So ransomware, it's fairly easy to define. Malicious software that holds something hostage, blocks access to something, and will give it back to you upon payment, uh, something along those lines. So, you know, give me your money or your files are mine, slide. The thing is, is that while we think of this as a fairly recent problem, it's actually one of the older computer-related crimes that have existed, with the first example going all the way back to the late 1980s when a virus was distributed on a floppy disk. You know, how many people remember what those are? And uh, it locked files on the computer and then specified a postal address that individuals needed to contact along with payment in order to receive a decryption key slide. But since then, uh, you know, we certainly had a long gap with no real measurable activity until things start to really pick up in the early 2010s, uh, 2012, or 2014, 2015, 2016 especially. And then going into 2017, 2018, it's like a Cambrian explosion of uh, ransomware evolution with dozens of families emerging and multiple entities getting into this market. So while business email compromise is still the most uh, financially harmful cyber uh, event that can impact an organization based on all available data, ransomware is a bit different given the fact that not only does it risk the loss of financial resources, but if you don't pay or uh, if the ransomware is not particularly well designed, since these are not always the best and brightest software developers out there, is that you also risk things like availability of information and potentially confidentiality, as we've seen mo more recently, ransomware authors turning to a combination of both locking access to files and then threatening to uh, post online items for embarrassment and to serve as a method mechanism for extortion slide. But over time, we've seen shifts in terms of spreading. Um, so prior to 20, 2017, we mostly had single victim, single machine samples with a per victim uh, approach. So I lock your aunt's photographs and documents or whatever, and she has to pay me uh, 0.5 Bitcoin in order to get them back. Then we start seeing an expansion to more organizational targeting through the use of self-propagating malware, either through exploits or through credential capture, where, you know, again, we would see a sort of per machine execution and sort of opportunistic targeting with the malware going wherever it managed to find its way within the environment. And then from 2018 to the present, things have gotten quite a bit more sophisticated, at least in the higher profile events, where we start seeing 
op interactive operations to breach networks in the same way that you would expect an espionage entity or uh, some other higher end uh, adversary or even a penetration testing team and using that to coordinate system network wide encryption and holding the entire organization hostage slide. So those earlier trends is typically we'd see something like phishing or a watering hole attack uh, back when we still had drive by downloads and code execution through a lot of browser vulnerabilities and some other items and using that for initial code execution that would land malware on the victim machine and then encrypt files to display whatever the payment instructions were with per victim keys and decryption routines. So this was presumably lucrative, but not terribly efficient, uh, dealing with lots and lots of people, lots and lots of different um, infection events. And I would imagine if you are a enterprising criminal, you could probably think of better ways to do this slide. So then we had the rise of the worms. Uh, presumably everyone recognizes this screen, the lock screen from WannaCry. Uh, WannaCry being a little bit interesting because it was a sort of shoddy monetization scheme by the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, lovely people that they are. Um, but it emphasized a new way of moving around networks in that it leveraged the MS1710 uh, vulnerability in SMB v1 in order to spread and spread quite rapidly. Uh, around the world until Marcus Hutchins deployed, uh, registered the domain that was being used as sort of a kill switch and uh, unexpectedly, but thankfully, stopped it from spreading from uh, being active slide. But vulnerabilities weren't the only items in play. So we also witnessed shortly after the WannaCry event a shift to a combination of credential reuse as well as using exploits, this being the case in something like NotPetya, which we'll talk about as being a very special sort of example in a bit. And then finally shifting into more pure credential capture and replay. So embedding Mimikatz or similar functionality with a a binary and using that in a combination of calling net commands and other items in order to spread throughout the network without having to rely on exploits at all, but just simply building off of credential reuse within the victim network slide. Then we started getting into the big game hunting sort of attacks. This initiated with uh, ransomware variants like Ryuk and LockerGoga and continues to this day with a multitude of families where we see adversaries breach networks, uh, whether through phishing, although it seems that more popular right now is brute forcing remote access portals through either captured passwords or again, brute forcing until they get in, uh, getting domain ad administrator rights within the network in question and using that access in order to seed the entire network with ransomware for coordinated ex execution. And and in these cases, instead of submitting a per machine uh, decryption as we saw in past instances, the sample deployed within the victim environment is somewhat tailored to that environment, which allows for negotiation of a uh, network-wide decryption, allowing for some rather large sums to exchange hands. Slide. So the new normal that we've seen in terms of spreading, um, so for access, for, well, in general, from an access perspective, uh, we're seeing a lot more brute force and remote access logons with phishing activities still prevalent, but not as prevalent as you'd think, at least for some of the higher profile items that have popped up within this space. In terms of pivoting, really eschewing any use of exploits and mostly relying on uh, living off the land binaries, the wonderfully nicknamed lol bins, uh, as well as lots of open source and commercial tools. So PS exec, Cobalt Strike, obviously not a a legitimate copy of Cobalt Strike uh, and using these efforts to get domain administrator or at least to get sufficient credential captures at an administrative level to allow for widespread pivoting and spreading malware into the environment. And then at the action stage, distributing a malicious group policy object or leveraging the domain admin credentials to script up uh, malware spread and coordinated execution within the victim environment slide. Well, concomitant with some of these trends is that we've observed a increase in industrial threats. So whereas once I'm looking at something like WannaCry and you can see a lovely picture there of WannaCry on an HMI in a plant environment, uh, we've gone from inadvertent access to industrial environments because of indiscriminate spreading and moved on to direct targeting or at least awareness of ICS operations and what this might mean for both monetizing an infection and increasing its pain to end users. Slide. So initially, 
industrial related attacks related to worms that spread too far. So in the case of WannaCry with its SMB based spreading mechanism, uh, SMB was frequently used and required by many data historian and business intelligence services to serve as the link between IT and control system and then within control system networks, which would mean that a if bi-directional firewall uh, traffic is allowed and permissions are set to allow for communications between the networks instead of just unidirectional, you can get something like a WannaCry spreading uh, quite rapidly and getting into the plant environment uh, somewhat unexpectedly. Then as we've got into Ryuk and some other items such as the Locker Goga incident of early 2019, uh, started seeing a shift that as a result of the more targeted way in which attacks were taking place in focusing on again that Git domain admin and then do bad things everywhere, that domain federation or links between domain, uh, active directories between control system environments and the I enterprise IT environment meant that uh, whether attackers were intending to do this or not, that malware was leaking into industrial networks because of Active Directory trusts between the various enclaves. And finally, most recently, we're seeing a, an interesting uptick from about mid-2019 to the present where we're witnessing tailored target proce uh, targeted process kill lists that are frequently referencing industrial specific equipment in order to disable processes likely to extend file encryption. Slide please. We've also seen changes in targeting trends over time. So while manufacturing has largely been victimized the entire time uh, with multiple strains uh, involved from late 2019 through early 2020, we started to see a very noticeable shift towards oil and gas operations with even some very large entities like the Mexican state petroleum company Pemex getting hit with ransomware. And it actually escapes me right now what the variant was, not that it really matters that much. And then most recently from about February of this year, moving forward, we started seeing you know, continued operations in manufacturing, less operations in oil and gas, the pandemic may and the oil price crash may have helped with this with the perception that maybe these companies just don't have the money to pay anymore, but increased emphasis on electric utility organizations. And in these cases, we're seeing multiple phases of operation targeted. So consumer facing IT portals, more or less all along the lines of traditional ransomware activity, but also going after some interesting targets such as balancing authorities um, and trading authorities and other areas of the overall electric sector. And what it appears is that between this shift to more critical infrastructure type industrial environments, along with the integration of ICS specific process um, disruption, that the risk appetite for bad actors seems to have increased, that they're more willing or able to accept the possibility that even if not intended, their actions may result in some unintended disruption within the environments in question. Slide. So looking at some utility operator targeted ransomware, we have some really notable examples. Uh, we hit there were include items as small as a electric utility cooperative operating in the Northwest Territories of Canada to the snake ransomware, which we refer to as Ekans, and actually most people refer to as Ekans, uh, hitting the NL group in about a month ago now, maybe two months ago. Seems like time is blurring together. And then um, also seeing things like the energy giant, uh, I've going to butcher the name because my Portuguese is uh, very poor, as one might imagine, but the Portuguese Energy Multinational EDP. And in these cases, while the attacks did not result in operational disruption, as in uh, ransomware was in the uh, control system environment and caused some sort of outage or disruption, there certainly is both deliberation, deliberateness and targeting of these entities, and then the possibility, even if not realized, given, especially in the case of something like Ekans and related malware using process kill uh, techniques, that a unintended disruption may have occurred had the malware been able to execute in the right, or in our case, an unfortunate location. Slide. So looking at process targeting malware, this gets really interesting because in a lot of cases, even going back to something like WannaCry, is that for the most important industrial processes, that dependent files are going to be programmatically locked. Uh, whatever the device in question is 
fundamentally doing um, and accessing at the time of operation, including things like licensing files, uh, databases used that are constantly being uh, consulted or written to in order to track operations, as you would see in a historian environment, uh, those files are going to be locked by the own program, and so they won't be available for encryption. So encrypting vital files, things like historian records, licensing keys, uh, and other such objects requires removing those file locks. So since 2019, we've seen uh, malware families include mechanisms to kill a variety of processes. This includes items like email servers and uh, generic database servers, but also very specific mentions of things like GE Prophecy and Siemens Step 7 related items in some recent examples that extend encryption into industrial specific contexts. Now, I have to emphasize that we at Dragos do not have emphasis that this malware has been deliberately deployed or used in a fashion to disrupt an industrial process, but that such functionality is present is cause for concern and emphasizes that should this malware find its way within an industrial environment, which we're seeing increasing examples of this happening for uh, reasons stated previously, that the possibilities for causing, again, an a even inadvertent disruption, uh, let alone deliberate process disruption, can be quite significant. Slide. So we've seen multiple uh, items. In fact, uh, I have one fire I report up here today. They released another public blog just this morning in the United States. If uh, people on the call haven't looked at it yet, I recommend checking that out. Nothing earth shattering new, but uh, just emphasizing the continuity of this trend. And this goes back to some Locker Goga and Megacortex examples from mid 2019, where process kill lists were deployed side by side with malware as separate batch files that would to just simply execute task kill and service stop operations against items of interest. Things get a little bit more interesting as we get into Ekans and now some examples of CLOP ransomware, where these process kill lists are embedded directly within the malware, so sort of decreasing overhead, uh, and present in a way that's obfuscated that prevents easy analysis or flagging as such without diving into the binaries a bit deeper. Slide. So as an example, you know, we're not talking about anything earth shatteringly complex or technically brilliant here. Um, and in fact, there are some errors in some of these items as well. So it's an open question as to just how these lists are being generated. Uh, it is noteworthy that in looking at uh, most of the Ekans examples that are out there, as well as the batch files, it seems that the list of process names is uh, continuous among samples, which would seem to indicate that these lists are not necessarily targeted, but rather a throw everything against the wall and see what sticks sort of approach, where things that were used by one actor or at one point in time are just automatically ported over into future iterations. So while concerning, there's no real evidence that uh, this is in any way specifically targeted at specific industrial technologies. So we see references to uh, technologies that would be either uh, very strange or unusual to find in the same environment because we're talking about competitors, uh, as well as targeting different areas of industrial operations along with a bunch of IT specific items. Slide. So that's all well and good, but ransomware is inherently disruptive. So an open question and something that I've, that's been bothering me for a couple of years now, and I've done a bit of work on this is, could we use ransomware to hide a deliberately disruptive or deliberately destructive action? Well, as we'll see on the next slide, the answer is yes, we've seen this very clearly already. In 2017, not that long after the WannaCry event, we had NotPetya. Uh, this zipped around the world after originating in Ukraine and caused massive outages and lots of damage at entities ranging from international shipping logistics companies to various types of manufacturers, pharmaceutical companies, etc. And it was subsequently shown um, by both the US and UK governments. I don't know if the Australian government put out a public statement on this, but anyway, two-fifths of the five eyes certainly did, that this action was not only not a ransomware event, which was proven technically a bit earlier, but one linked directly to the Russian military, military intelligence, GRU, uh, later assessed to likely be the sandworm actor. Slide. What was interesting about NotPetya though is that in many ways it was kind of a failure. So if we looked at the impact that NotPetya had, while it's pretty obvious given the initial infection vector was a malicious version or a malicious update for a piece of Ukrainian accounting software, uh, MEDOC, 
that was used to seed this in initial environments. And Sandworm has operated in a destructive fashion in Ukraine for many years. They have not really operated in a destructive fashion in many other places. Uh, or some other potential examples like the TV5 Le Mans uh, incident in France and uh, some other isolated examples, but nothing of this scale. So it almost seems that NotPetya spread way too far, causing collateral damage, which if you are a state-sponsored entity, you would think that would be quite risky because now we're entering very ill-defined areas of at what point does a oopsie become the pretext for cyber war. But also just from a purely technical perspective, NotPetya was not a credible ransomware example. The way in which NotPetya generated the um, IDs associated with the encryption key for each system infection was just a random number generator. So there was no way for the attacker to uh, possibly predict or uh, generate a decryption key for the ransomware. So it's almost like the NotPetya function by locking a system and then throwing away the key and doing so in a way that was especially disruptive because it also attacked the master boot record. So ultimately all of this and then just given the sheer magnitude of the event resulted in uh, multiple governments stepping forward and confirming this as a state-directed disruption operation slide. But what if we were to revise NotPetya and make it into a more plausible attack? So the first thing that we have to do is make sure that we're using an actual encryption method that works. So this means that recovery has to be plausible. That doesn't mean that we have to do it. We could just as long as it is from a technically observable standpoint, reasonable to conclude that there is a way to reverse the encryption, we can ensure that we're looking more like authentic ransomware. Then let's try and make the spreading mechanism more focused. Worms can get out of control. But as we've seen with the trend with other ransomware variants, the uh, path to domain admin and similar sorts of functionality allows for greater selectivity in targeting and ensuring that the malware does not spread too far. And then finally, we can try and evade attribution by better blending in to produce plausible deniability. One interesting aspect of NutPetya is that the ransomware variant to which it was closely related, Petya, had been dormant for months when NutPetya emerged uh, and kind of swept onto the scene. Whereas if someone could take a family of ransomware or a type of ransomware that was at least uh, reasonably similar to existing items that were currently in use, it could better blend in with existing criminal operations and evade uh, some, of the, uh, some of the anomalous uh, looking behavior that, hmm, where did this sample that seems especially disruptive or come from all of a sudden? Slide. Well, we might have gotten this in uh, March of 2019 with an event that took place at Norwegian Aluminum and other uh, manufacturing company, Norse Kedro. So in this example, a ransomware family that was then rising to prominence called Locker Goga uh, hit Norsk and hit them really hard and resulted in not just um, disruption of the IT operations, but also manufacturing disruption uh, given some of the systems that were hit. But what was interesting about the Locker Goga variant that was used at Norse Kedro is that it was significantly different uh, while retaining the same encryption schema as other samples of Locker Goga that were previously operating as recently as within uh, a week of the Norse Kedro incident. So in the case of Norse Kedro, uh, slide please. Ah, never mind. Uh, next, uh, so I've written about this particular example extensively. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so you can check out. There's a white paper on this that's also linked in the references at the end of this slide. But to summarize, Locker Goga at Norse Kedro, uh, its behavior was quite strange. So Locker Goga would execute. It would remove itself from disk, launch child processes, fairly standard, but then it wrote the ransom note first. Typically, you see this as one of the last steps, and it was the last step in previous Lakagoga variants, and then it starts encrypting various files and binaries outside of the system directory, and then some really strange functionality emerges. So first, local user accounts, uh, both regular user and administrator accounts, if they exist, the passwords are changed. They're changed to a hard-coded value within the binary, but unless you know to look for it and what it means, uh, it would involve some reverse engineering and malware analysis to figure out just what that value is. Then the malware disables the system network card. So at that point, you're no longer able to communicate remotely with the machine or log onto the machine as a remote user. And then finally, to close things off and sort of tie things in a nice neat bow, uh, all logged on users are kicked off. So at this point, you would like to think that if you're trying to monetize an infection, you at least want to make sure that whoever it is that you're bothering has a chance to read your ransom note. Whereas with the way that this executes, unless you catch the ransom note as it's written before the system is actually locked, you're basically locked out of the device and have to either 
uh, undergo forensic analysis or look at the malware sample itself if you can capture one as a way of figuring out just who the hell you're supposed to talk to in order to even make payment. Slide. But also, it's really weird about what happened or what hasn't happened with Locker Goga since Hedro. So since 19 March, there's one possible event that might have used Locker Goga as its ransomware variant, but no uh, definitive public events have involved Locker Goga since the North Hedro incident. Second, uh, analysis and government reporting, as well as a lot of Norwegian news sources, indicates that there were other entities in Norway that were targeted simultaneously with a roughly sim simultaneous uh, version of the malware. Uh, what's an interesting about that is that it appears that IT personnel at North Kidro shared with Norwegian CERT quite quickly when they noticed the incident taking place. And based on that sharing, other organizations were able to apply that information in order to defend their own networks. And while I've verified this with multiple European law enforcement authorities that investigations into this are ongoing because people are a little peeved about this one, that there have been no criminal charges or suspects at this time. And we're at a over two, well, we're coming up on a year and a half, two years now. So maybe the wheels of justice are grinding along and grinding along slowly. But overall, White Walker Goga seems, based upon the inconvenience of trying to um, find the uh, ransom information as well as the uniquely disruptive nature of logging off users and other items, that the Locker Goga sample associated with the Hedro event seems like it was something different uh, or at least a very inefficient piece of ransomware. Slide. Well, this wasn't an isolated event either because just a few months ago, uh, at the beginning of May, we had a new ransomware family emerge onto the scene called uh, Coldlock. No one had ever heard of Coldlock before until Trend Micro reported on it publicly uh, in the first week of May. But it seemed that Coldlock was very selective in its targeting, focusing exclusively on organizations in Taiwan, and as subsequently shown, some rather interesting elements of the Taiwanese economy, including the country's only two oil and gas distribution and refining companies, and some of the companies. Uh, economically significant uh, chip fabrication in packaging plants. But then what got even more interesting was a couple of weeks later, the Taiwanese Ministry of Justice released a very interesting statement claiming that hackers known as the Winty Group were behind the ransomware attack. Now, Winty Group is a mess of a name. Um, in fact, for Drago's threat intelligence subscribers, we'll have a deep dive on this coming out as soon as I can finish it. But um, Winty refers to a piece of malware that is used by a number of threat actors, but all those threat actors and all associated Winty activity are at minimum associated with Chinese uh, based actors and in many, especially most recent cases, with Chinese state interests. So what we have here essentially is uh, a democratic government, the government of Taiwan, saying that what was a ransomware event, the cold lock white uh, event at various Taiwanese organizations, uh, was a state-sponsored activity. And when you look at what cold lock's functionality was, uh, slide please. It gets really weird here as well, because cold lock is a Wiper had some interesting execution options that limited what time of day it would execute and how it would get loaded into the system. And then an extended encryption in an interesting way by incorporating some of the process kill uh, techniques we've been talking about, but focused on database and email servers. So trying to make sure that thing, that data in, you know, typically in motion or in use was also encrypted as a result of the event to sort of extend the pain. But it was really weird in looking at the directory and file selection for encryption. It's a very complex, very non-obvious algorithm that includes things like had a, a file must have been written within the last uh, by such and such a date in this directory for that directory to be encrypted. But if that directory contains more less than X number of files or more than Y number of files, do not encrypt it along with a bunch of other scenarios. So again, it just looks really strange. If you're writing a piece of ransomware, you're trying to make money off of it, presumably, I'm, I'm not a criminal, I don't think, so I'm just guessing here. Uh, you want to expend the minimum amount of effort to gain the most amount of money. And this sort of coding just seems very strange and non-obvious. So you have a very odd looking wiper that since then we haven't seen anywhere else, which again goes back to an efficiencies and scalability issue that uh, if you were to design a brand new piece of 
uh, ransomware or malware for criminal use, why would you use it in only a handful of very geographically isolated incidents? Whereas we look at every other ransomware family that while there are themes, like we saw a Nephilim theme in Australia and New Zealand not that long ago, as well as uh, other sorts of waves that seem to shift in geography over time, we at least do see reuse of malware. Whereas with cult lock, we're yet to see another example of this emerge in the wild. Next slide. So yeah, all cult lock victims are in Taiwan. The victims included strategically significant aspects of the Taiwan economy, including their only oil refining and distribution companies. And we haven't seen it since early May, which again, seems curious. Slide. So ransomware as a cyber weapon becomes pretty interesting pretty quickly because we can utilize or modify a ransomware variant that already exists, potentially add some additional disruptive impacts in order to inhibit recovery and maximize the amount of disruption we can inflict on a target. And then to try to avoid the collateral damage witnessed in NAPETIA, use the same techniques that ransomware authors are using for their own operations in order to spread things in a reasonably limited and focused uh, manner. And even if the ransomware is perfectly functional, we don't have to have an intention of disclosing the key or responding to ransomware negotiations in order to perpetuate that disruption. So that might look a little bit fishy and probably might throw some things off, but especially, and I, this was the case with Hydro that I thought very interesting, maybe not so much the case with uh, Taiwan as I don't have as good of an understanding of the business environment there, but uh, Norway as a very transparent uh, co country with very strict rules concerning business ethics, um, I am quite certain in saying that Norse Kidro could not legally have paid the ransom in order to access their files, nor could any other uh, Norwegian domiciled company do the same. Uh, they could try to hide that, but again, that would be taking some sort of a risk. And just the possibility of either prosecution or bad reputation as a result is non-trivial. And if you have this as a targeted attack, we can assume that the attacker realized this. And so launching a ransomware event at an entity you know isn't allowed to pay a ransom means that you are shifting your attack and taking advantage of events in order to uh, take something that looks like a criminal act into a uh, disruptive attack slide. Now the advantages of this are pretty pretty interesting. So you get plausible deniability, something that didn't exist in NotPetya, while also having very effective disruption that blends into uh, fairly widespread criminal activity. The tools of it in question are available for purchase and even for modification uh, if you can get source code off of various dark web markets and other things. And we see in the case of items like Ekans where source code modification does exist because recent variants of Ekans include very target specific references such as to the local domain environment and local network infrastructure to ensure that it's executing in the right place. And as a result of all of this, there's no need to use zero days or uh, disclose sensitive infrastructure that for launching these attacks, everything is commoditized with an existing in criminal markets, except for some of the little tweaks in order to make things a bit more uh, interesting or unfortunate for defenders. Slide. So what do we do from a defense and detection standpoint? Well, first, right somewhere defense still applies. So doing things like blocking the execution of unsigned unknown binaries where you can do so, limiting the ability to spread in network environments and hardening things like access to domain controllers. From an ICS specific perspective, minimizing links and knowing what links exist between the IT and the industrial environments and making sure those links are both monitored and secured to minimize the threat of bleed over from one environment to the other. Furthermore, we need to start identifying mechanisms to facilitate sharing of information on these items because this sort of potential operation, we start talking about state-sponsored disruptive activity masquerading as ransomware, is going to be able to effectively hide as long as there's a lot of questions and uncertainty around what took place. But at least within trusted sharing groups and within industry organizations, if we can work together and share notes on what's going on, such activity could plausibly be disclosed and we can start working to put a stop to it or at least disincentivize uh, bad actors from using this as a uh, possibility, which goes into a next thing, and this is more of a public policy item, but uh, we need greater pressure on law enforcement agencies to actually take some reasonable, meaningful effort against criminal ransomware. We've seen some more indictments uh, 
from the US at least against ransomware operators, but a lot of the locations where criminal enterprises are operating from feature limited or no cooperation with local legal authorities, making extradition difficult or too impossible. But as we saw with some recent BEC prosecutions and arrests, uh, it's not impossible. We can make this work. And by sort of draining the swamp of criminal ransomware actors, we remove the ability for state-backed activity to hide amongst the noise in order to, for, to execute far more nefarious activity. Slide. So this is a very short list of additional work on the ransomware subject. If you look at the spyware stealer locker wiper white paper on Locker Goga, the last link on that list, you will find pretty much as much uh, information or links to further information on ransomware as you would wish. Um, please check that out if you thought this was at all interesting as it dive into the case a lot deeper there. But uh, otherwise, I have I am open for questions or if you have questions, I have things to, to say. Looks like there might be one new one that popped up in the quick Q&A. Let's have a look. Yeah, I'll say. A lot of these appear to be state-sponsored. Which are the most likely nations to be targeting Australia or Australia's energy sector specifically? So uh, along those lines, while Dragos officially does not perform state-centered attribution of adversary activity, what I can say is based upon publicly available information and what has been documented by other governments, that we've seen two states in particular, um, potentially Russia with the uh, NAPETCHA event, and then uh, the People's Republic of China with the Cold Lock event have been involved in, the, in this sort of space. And if, if you were to ask me to hazard a guess as to who might be responsible for the North Kidro incident, I would say the adversary likely shares a very, very small land border and a disputed maritime border uh, with a much larger country to its east. So having said that, um, well, we already know uh, quite plainly, and the Australian government has not been shy about saying this, that the Australian industry is very much a target of PRC-related cyber operations. Granted, most of those operations thus far are espionage in nature, stealing of secrets and other items, but the same access that could be used in order to steal secrets can also be leveraged later on to launch something along these lines. And unless the Chinese suddenly go very Iranian-like, as we've seen in the Shamoon events, and just decide, eh, we'll wipe whatever we want and be done with it, uh, this sort of ransomware-like attack potentially as we saw with cold lock, could be used to mask this activity in a deniable way uh, for actions ranging from increasing political pressure to potentially covering tracks within an environment once an adversary realizes they've been discovered. So are we likely to see that? I'm not 100% sure because it's a highly provocative action and Taiwan unfortunately is fairly isolated in terms of who can support it and there are uh, far greater nationalistic interests in play uh, uh, on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. Uh, but I would not certainly sleep on this, and which is why the risks for ransomware are potentially a bit more than uh, we'd be uh, typically willing to say. It's not just a question of like, well, the worst case scenario, I can just pay to decrypt my files. But well, depending on who's attacking you, that might not be the case. Thanks, Joe, that was brilliant. Uh, I, I can't believe the, the time just escaped there. So. Um... There's Thank one you. more question um, if we have time or no. Yeah, no, any, any last minute questions before we move on to our last speaker? Anyone, anyone? So I've got one. What sort of cyber drills or tabletops uh, help organizations to exercise against ransomware incidents as TTPs may be different, especially in the ICS space? So at this stage, I would say that uh, preparation and drills really moves almost more into the uh, business continuity, uh, disaster recovery planning, that you know, we do a really good job in an engineering environment to make sure that we can recover from physical damage, physical incidents that can significantly limit disruption. And we need to extend that same mindset to potential cyber disruption. And doing so means to have items at the ready so that you can quickly recover or even fail over uh, an infected, impaired system to a last known, 
known good configuration to try and re uh, restore operations as quickly as possible. Uh, obviously, one of the important parts about that is ensuring overall operational integrity because we don't want to get into a situation similar to the Triton Trisis incident, and it's funny I mentioned that as Julian has hopped on, but um, <laughs> where the potential exists for restoring operations in an environment that has been compromised, but not in a way that's immediately evident, such as the compromise of safety in the 2017 Saudi Arabia event. So certainly incorporating a cyber response exercise, not so much focusing on typical IT incident response activity, but really blending in the physical process environment recovery and restoration to known good, known safe is really the, the key there. I think that's a wrap. Thank you so much, Joe. Okay, thank you. And uh, now with a bit more uh, local theme, and he's probably on his third coffee, uh, given the early start, Julian, welcome. So you know Julian <laughs> Gumanis is a principal industrial uh, incident responder out of our Australian practice. Extensive experience responding to nation state adversaries and now primarily supports Drago's customers with threat hunting and incident response activities. So, Today, Julian's talking about industrial threat hunting, the, the when, where, and how. And uh, over to you, mate. Thank you, Warren, and thanks, Joe. Um, you're a hard man to follow. <laughs> Always enjoy your talks. Um, I guess I'll kick this off. Um, I, I did want to take the opportunity to thank Ben May and the crew at uh, AEMO for organizing this uh, conference. It's, it's awesome to have the opportunity to present um, and share the information that we have. Um, and also just, just for organizing and running this uh, Energy Intel group. It's a great community to be a part of and it's extremely important to keep this, um, this practice going in Australia. So if you're on the call um, through a separate invite, I highly recommend you investigate uh, joining up uh, Energy Intel group and having a chat with Ben. Um, so my name is Julian Gabanis, uh, as Warren said, Principal Instant, uh, Industrial Incident Responder. Um, I, I'm based out of Perth, uh, been at Dragos just going on about 18 months now. Um, so previously uh, I was working at Saudi Aramco, uh, as Joe was mentioning, responded with uh, the Trisis incident, um, which was entertaining um, to say the least. And then uh, previously before that I was working in the US, uh, different kind of utilities and different sectors to work around. Um, Cool. Uh, so this, this talk is uh, in relation to industrial threat hunting, kind of getting started. Um, if you haven't done it before, just uh, kind of ways to approach it. And uh, hopefully there's some information in here that uh, you can take away and um, use within your organization. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just as a bit of background for this. Uh, so this is a very, very high level um, discussion. Um, we're really kind of just scraping the surface of threat hunting. Uh, Dragos actually provides a five day course um, assessing and defending industrial control system environments. Um, one entire day is dedicated to threat hunting. So I've got 30 minutes. Um, so it's going to be a high kind of abstract view of um, what we kind of teach in that course. Um, if you do get an opportunity to, to attend that course, we do some online at the moment, thanks to COVID. COVID. Um, so there's been a, a move towards online training. Um, however, we are opening up a training facility in an office in Melbourne uh, when things start to settle down. Um, so hopefully next year. Um, again, this is going to be quite high level. So a lot of the material that I'm, I'm, I'm basing this on is uh, quite readily available on Dragos's website. Some really great papers that you can um, grab to um, in, improve your hunting if you're doing it already or to kind of kick yourself off um, and get started. So hunting with rigor from Dan, um, collection management frameworks, I'm not really touching so much on in this talk. However, I'm um, highly recommended to uh, adapt and review these uh, frameworks for, for your environment. Um, and then some other ways to kind of generate hypotheses by looking at you know, the MITRE attack for ICS uh, and then some um, Actually, that bottom bottom one they're generating hypotheses for successful threat hunting is is quite heavily uh, focused in this talk. Um, so, next slide, please. Um, so, it's a bit of homework. Um, threat hunting, you know, while it is uh, is, is beneficial for throughout all maturities of your organisation, is probably not the first thing you really want to focus on. Um, definitely, the talk that Austin gave before was. Um, probably more beneficial if you're, if you're just starting off in your OT security uh, framework and your OT security capabilities. Um, so really before we start into threat hunting, it's better to really understand our operations, understand the architecture for our control networks, um, gain visibility into your assets. So looking at those free tools that Austin spoke about earlier, um, Sophia and uh, 
cyber lens, definitely worthwhile looking into. Um, and then identify your collection points and log sources. Um, this is sort of looking at that collection management framework that I discussed earlier, um, but it won't be going to too much in this. Uh, I highly recommend getting that. So this, this information will really um, benefit you when you start getting into threat hunting and identifying you know, what you want to look at. Um, finally, gain trust. If you haven't really started building relationships with your engineering team, um, with your engineers and operators with plant networks, uh, it, it's it's a perfect place to, to start off with. Um, really kind of try to gain trust of these organizations because they're the ones that are on the ground and seeing what's going on. Um, they can help you out. Slide, please. So threat hunting, uh, what is threat hunting? So it's a focused and iterative approach to searching out and identifying and understanding adversaries in, uh, internal to the defenders and networks. So basically what we're kind of thinking about here is we're looking at a, um, we're already compromised perspective. Um, a threat hunter really needs to take that perspective of um, we are already compromised, we have adversaries within our network and we're trying to identify where they are and um, what they're doing. Um, we try, to um, hunt to reduce our friction, so make things easier for us, uh, reduce the friction of you know, um, limitations with our monitoring capabilities, limitations with uh, organizational and operational capabilities um, to give a bit more freedom to uh, the hunt teams um, to look out and seek adversary behavior, and then also to increase adversaries' friction. So we're trying to make things difficult for the adversaries. We don't want them just having um, a free-for-all within our environments. Um, we kind of want to put that scenario of um, the adversary just needs to be successful once where defenders need to be successful all the time on its head. Um, adversaries need to be successful all the time. We just need to find one trace of evidence of them and then pivot and, and investigate the activity. Um, slide, please. Um, so when do we hunt? Um, there's, there's a number of opportunities for us to engage in hunting activities. Periodic is, is obviously a, um, a reasonable scenario that we can look at. Um, there's a number of ways we can do this. So we may do like a quarterly hunt. We may do um, a monthly hunt or weekly hunts. Um, there's some uh, lessons we can adapt from uh, DevSecOps teams um, in, in the scenario where we may have a security team that's dedicated four days a week to specific uh, responsibilities. And then one day a week, they get a, a, a hunt opportunity to go and look through the environment. Um, that's it's, it's a nice way to do things. Uh, you may have a dedicated hunt team that does it all the time, or you may just have a number of operators that uh, do it on a periodic basis. Um, we may have intelligence initiated uh, hunts. So um, all the information that's coming through from you know, the previous talk that uh, Joe well, previous talks Joe and Casey gave. Um, if you have a subscription to the Worldview portal, um, there's a huge amount of data that comes out of there um, and a lot of lot of things that you can start looking for um, as, as well as a lot of online sources. Um, we may have network neighbor events. So if you're a um, ICS focused hunt team um, and you have some kind of events within your IT or corporate perimeter, um, that may kick off the opportunity to do a hunt within your environment. Um, similarly, we may have some kind of events or public news that comes out about our vendors or third parties um, that could kick off the need for a, a hunt with our environments, make sure that we are um, not impacted by similar kind of events. Um, finally, a, a really good one, and I highly recommend that um, you engage with your operations teams because operational events um, may be probably the best thing you can look for for hunt opportunities. So if we have some kind of... Uh, misbehaving assets within operational environments. We have assets that are um, you know, uh, failing and dropping off uh, offline, similar to like the Trisis event where we had uh, the safety controllers that were rebooting unexpectedly. Um, it may be an opportunity for us to go, well, okay, it may be investigated from a mechanical standpoint, but why don't we do a threat hunt to make sure that nothing is actually um, triggering that, uh, something else malicious within our environment. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the problems that we do encounter with uh, new hunt teams uh, is basically um, being provided so much information and so much freedom that they don't really know where to start. Um, so and some of the requests that we also get is basically just to monitor um, certain network interfaces and tell us what, what, they can, what we can find. So that approach is... Um, only a beneficial to a certain level. Um, what we really want to do is add structure to our threat hunting. Um, this is probably the first thing we really need to focus on when we, we're starting our threat hunt practices. Um, so for each hunt, we want to um, create a purpose for the hunt. We want goals, objectives, and outcomes for these hunts. We want to scope our hunt to specific locations, specific time windows. Um, so 
uh, when when operators are on on shift, when they're not on shift, things like that. Um, it may be a window of um, activity that a um, adversary has been operating through a threat intelligence feed. Um, different ways we can look at. Um, we want to equip uh, equip our hunt. So we want to look at specific uh, ways we can collect data throughout the environment. We want to look at um, ways we can test um, our hunt uh, hypotheses uh, and different uh, information we can review. Um, finally, we want to um, plan and review and execute the hunt um, and then provide feedback from the hunt. So we want to look at what we actually achieved, how we can be better, how we can automate it, how we can improve our defenses. Um, next slide, please. So making things actionable, we want to take our hypotheses for our um, threat hunts uh, and turn these into uh, specific ways we can validate these hypotheses. So we have a concept of validators. Um, we want to be able to either prove or disprove our hypotheses. If we're looking at a hypothesis that says that a specific, specific adversary group is within our environment, um, we want to have ways to say that yes, they are or no, they're not. Um, and we want to be able to prove that and provide reporting to um, demonstrate value of the hunt. Um, so from our validators, we create tests, uh, and from these tests, we create collections. Um, so we identify ways within the environment, what data we have available that can prove or disprove our tests. Um, at the same time, we want to eliminate assumptions and bias. So uh, assumptions based on the fact of uh, how we understand the way we do things and bias uh, also um, can impact the way that we do kind of collections. So we really want to just take the data that we're looking at, make sure that our uh, tests and collections um, are a direct uh, method of uh, proving our hypotheses. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a really good paper. It's actually written by Rob Lee, who's the uh, CEO of Dragos, uh, as well as David Bianco. Um, it's available on the SANS portal, uh, and it's really about generating successful hypotheses. Uh, I'm going to go into these in a little bit more detail, and then. We'll Pretty much the rest of the talk, but um, generally the way we look at it, there's three uh, three ways to generate hypotheses. Um, Maybe some overlap between each of these uh, uh, generation approaches, but the the main three are uh, intelligence driven, uh, situational awareness driven, and domain expertise driven. So highly recommend reading this document. It's, it lays the foundation for the talk and um, really can enable you with uh, hunting. Uh, slide, please. So first thing I'm going to talk about is intelligence-driven hypotheses uh, slide. Uh, so intelligence-driven hypotheses is really uh, the awareness of threat intelligence, the use of uh, indicators of compromise and knowledge of adversary tactics, techniques, and procedures. So what we're looking for here is indicators uh, and TTPs. Indicators may be things like, uh, like IP addresses or infrastructure that the, the, the adversaries are leveraging for, for attacks. Um, we know specific uh, campaigns that are going on, so we want to make sure that we're, we're making uh, our best effort to identify whether or not we can find uh, traces of these activities within our environment. Um, also taking from the knowledge of these uh, Intel reports that uh, TTPs, so whether or not the, the infrastructure or the ICs are still relevant by looking at the specific um, tactics that are being leveraged uh, by the adversaries. Slide, please. So I tried to keep this talk as relevant as possible to Australia. However, there's been a um, significant moving target at the moment uh, with all of the uh, vulnerabilities and things popping up all over the place. Uh, it seems like every day um, something new is popping up. So um, huge sympathy to defenders, uh, defenders on the call who are having to patch all these vulnerabilities and making sure, sure that your environment isn't impacted. Um, However, recently, uh, the report that came out by ACSC uh, in relation to the copy-paste compromises, um, huge amount of uh, techniques in here, huge amount of infrastructure and ISCs that we can leverage to operationalize a threat intelligence-driven hunt. Um, this is really well handled by ACSC. Uh, it's also been mentioned by Ben in the New Zealand conference recently, but um, very well handled by ACSC. They provided opportunities for um, key stakeholders to engage prior to um, releasing this information. So Dragos is one of these stakeholders as a threat intelligence partner um, to ACSC. Um, we received an early release of this document um, and Casey and Joe did some awesome work in actually identifying additional infrastructure that was being leveraged as part of this campaign. Um, so around about the same time that this report came out and another intelligence report came out by Dragos that um, covered these te techniques and uh, indicators. Um, so 
what was identified was uh, potential, there was some overlap in terms of the indicators and the techniques being used by um, these campaigns with a number of the groups that we are tracing. Uh, two in particular is Parasite and Crysine. Um, so there's some uh, write-ups on uh, the Worldview portal if you have access to, to read through information about these, uh, these groups. Um, I'm gonna go, well, next slide, and we'll go into a little bit more detail on Parasite activities. So, um, Parasite's a, a group that we are tracing. Um, they've been around since about 2017. Um, Dragos has actually responded to a number of incidents where um, we have identified uh, this group as well. So their activities um, within organizations, specifically uh, US-based, um, some in the utility sector. Um, the group is, has been seen to leverage quite, um, quite a lot of emerging vulnerabilities, um, specifically targeting remote access solutions like VPNs, uh, Pulse Secure, Fortinet gateways, uh, quite likely to move on to the F5 vulnerabilities, Citrix gateway vulnerabilities, who knows the DNS stuff that's all come out. Um, as I said, it's moving target at the moment with uh, the amount of uh, releases. Um, so using this information um, and these reports, we can now start to generate a hypothesis for a hunt. Um, so next slide, please. So using the models uh, that we've just spoken about, the Intel, we can potentially look at uh, creating a, a workbook that covers a, a hunt for parasites and a VPN compromise. Um, it'll be you know, obviously relevant to your environments, uh, whether or not you have VPN infrastructure, which VPN infrastructure you have. Um, however, this is just an example of how we can leverage this for a, for a successful hunt. Um, so for the catalyst for this hunt, we have a public threat intelligence report context. Uh, Parasite group is um, targeting uh, widespread uh, targeting regions with widespread compromises, leveraging VPN exploits to get authorized access to industrial organizations. So as part of this hypothesis and this hunt, we want to look at um, a compromise to plant network by a compromise of VPN infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so sometimes it is difficult to actually go into um, a, a threat intelligence report and just straight up hunt for uh, what is defined in that in that report. Um, this is kind of an example of the Palo Alto vulnerability um, that Parasite was leveraging. Um, so while we do have some indicators within that, uh, with these reports about the infrastructure and stuff that's been leveraged, um, the TTPs and, and how to hunt for a Palo Alto uh, VPN compromise is somewhat um, undocumented. Um, luckily, Palo Alto is quite um, polite and nice to us, and they provide uh, virtual machine instances of their uh, firewall infrastructure that you can configure uh, and spin up test uh, test environments for this stuff. So sometimes as a hunt, you may actually need to spin up test infrastructure to identify what you can see as part of that hunt. Um, so really good write up here on that Palo Alto vulnerability, um, and it's a, a demonstration of basically what it is. So um, this is by the guys that identified it. Um, so it was a format string attack that was in, impacting the SSL manager uh, interface on the on the, uh, the firewall, uh, the VPN firewall. Um, so firstly, as part of the hunt, we could potentially look for just the indicators. So who's actually targeting this infrastructure, who, um, parasite, where they're coming from, what kind of stuff. However, what we can also do is look at for other evidence that maybe somebody else has been targeting this vulnerability. Um, so. Uh, within the firewall, we can look at uh, the SSL VPN access logs. And uh, in, this, in this image, you can see down the bottom there that we can see uh, a post to the SSL manager uh, URI on the gateway that would indicate um, a potential attempt at uh, this exploit. Next slide, please. Um, so to operationalize this, we can use uh, the, uh, the Intel reports as well as our, our research into the infrastructure and kind of make a, um, a TTP observables map. Um, There's a really good talk, uh, a presentation here as well um, by Dan Gunter, um, look at link down the bottom there, um, which identifies this kind of TTP observables and creating a threat intelligence driven hunt. Um, so for Parasite, the activity group, the attack stage delivery, we're looking at the VPN compromise and we look at what we can observe um, from this compromise. So firstly, suspicious access, we're looking for the indicators of Parasite um, trying to access our VPN infrastructure. We look for the evidence of exploit. So we're going back to that previous slide on um, what we can see uh, as when that uh, vulnerability has been exploited. Um, and then also evidence of what could have occurred after the, the exploit of that vulnerability. So potentially unexpected accounts on the VPN, um, maybe they've modified things like uh, the two-factor authentication, um, different things like that. 
Next slide, please. So continuing our threat hunt workbook, we look at our um, tests, uh, which is going to validate our hypotheses. Um, so we want to identify suspicious access to the SSL manager um, URI. Uh, we can look at our collections. So that's looking at those uh, VPN logs, looking at the uh, SSL VPN or uh, uh, web logs. Um, we want to look at our indicators. So identify known bad connections, but again, VPN logs, uh, identify suspicious connections. So maybe things we weren't expecting. Um, if we're an Australian energy entity and we start seeing attempted connections from uh, China and Russia and things like that, then we want to kind of get to look at those in a bit more detail. Um, and then, yeah, suspicious inbound traffic from the VPN. This might be um, additional ways we can hunt. So rather than just focusing on the VPN, we can we can focus our hunt on what's actually occurring from the VPN. So where are the users that connect into the VPN actually accessing? So uh, is there anybody pivoting from the VPN into our um, plant networks and into our DMZs, things like that? Um, and then, yeah, un unexpected accounts and two-factor authentication, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so this is just a really an example of how you can operationalize a hunt um, with with uh, an intelligence-driven uh, scenario. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so secondly, we're going to talk about situational awareness-driven uh, hunts. Uh, slide. So. As opposed to intelligence-driven hunts, we're now looking at situational awareness-driven hunts, and this is a little bit different. Um, rather than looking at externally external uh, inputs, we're now looking at uh, our own internal inputs. Uh, we're looking at our understanding of our environments. We want to know our specific networks, our specific assets, and how everything is architected to get together, the communication flows, things like that. Um, once we understand our environment, the next thing we really need to do is figure out what our most important assets are you know what is in our environment what does our worst day look like um, in the trisis scenario that we responded to the safety controllers were um, pretty much our crown jewels we know that the safety controllers are the things potentially stopping the plant from going into a, a catastrophic state um, so this is definitely something we'd want to focus on um, so really a situational awareness driven hunt is um, understanding our network and identifying what an adversary might be looking for upon getting into our network uh, slide, please. So common architecture for plant environments. Um, most organizations are pretty pretty familiar with ISO 95, uh, the Purdue model. Um, this is a very common uh, scenario of what you will see in your environments. Um, we'll have operators and engineers that may have uh, remote access through VPN infrastructure. It's very common to have terminal servers within our DMZ uh, and leveraging the, uh, RDP or some other services like Citrix and things like that, uh, and then accessing from the DMZ into the plant network. Uh, slide, please. And this isn't really an architecture recommendation talk, but a, a better architecture scenario would be to have a, a multiple layered VPN infrastructure um, where we have remote, remote access into the DMZ secured by uh, multi-factor authentication and then followed by RDP to a terminal server um, with individual user accounts that we can control access and time to. Uh, slide, please. Now, while that is the recommended architecture, um, the realistic viewpoint of um, today's deployments uh, is a little bit different. So we still see scenarios where we have uh, engineers, operators accessing directly from the internet into the DMZ infrastructure. They may be directly into RDP infrastructure that's sitting on the internet. Um, we also have uh, scenarios where we may have uh, third parties that have inter uh, have access into our control networks. Um, vendors, third parties that are looking at uh, maintenance and diagnostics activities. Um, it's still very common uh, to have uh, direct feeds or some kind of uh, pivoted feeds directly into the uh, plant networks. Next slide, please. So as an example of this, and, and again, this is just really an example of situational awareness driven hunts. Um, it really relies on your understanding of your environment and your understanding of what's actually occurring within your plant networks. However, what is very common in, uh, in, in uh, power generation assets, specifically GE turbines. Uh, GE actually leverages a um, remote monitoring and diagnostic system. Um, so GE has almost a backdoor into um, thousands of deployed turbines around the world um, where they can access uh, operating systems, they can access the controllers and things to identify um, 
how things are operating, identified doing predictive maintenance, things like that, um, to make sure that uh, turbines are operating correctly uh, and the health of the turbines aren't reaching any uh, dangerous uh, scenarios. Next slide, please. Um, another scenario where we have some vendor information and communications within our environments, this is quite common within the Australian power generation uh, environments. Uh, so this dig silence, uh, power system monitoring is actually uh, recommended by the national energy markets uh, for modeling of uh, power generation. Um, so it provides um, functionality to model the Australian uh, energy uh, generation markets uh, and provides um, some kind of uh, reassurances to the, the operators that um, we understand our networks and our grids. So while there are traditionally has been a um, scenario of um, you know, we're air gapped. Um, it, it really is in the, uh, that scenario. There are communications with our environments to vendors. There are outbound and inbound communications to different systems. Um, we need to be aware of these uh, within our environment. We need to model what our environment looks like for these kind of uh, hunts. Next slide, please. So taking this information and this example, we may generate a, uh, a hypothesis that our engineering access has been compromised uh, and is allowing uh, access into our environment. Um, so in this scenario, we have a, a situation of wireless catalyst. Um, it's a periodic hunt. Um, the context is the power generation facility leverages a gas turbine. Um, the gas turbine vendor has persistent access to the turbine for maintenance and diagnostics. Um, so this is something that is uh, quite common and it's quite a good hunt if you do have uh, remote access for ven uh, vendors and engineering. Um, good hunt to operationalize. Next slide, please. So uh, an opti optimistic viewpoint on the scenario um, and hopefully the architecture deployed within your environments will be something similar, but we would expect to see our, oh, I think we just lost the slide. Sorry, <laughs> thank you. Um, so you'd expect to see a firewall, at least on our side, probably a firewall on the vendor's side. Um, you'll have a number of uh, scenarios, potentially you have a jump host or some kind of proxy servers within your environment um, that's being leveraged to access systems. Um, these are all collection points that we can look at. So we can look at the potential firewall logs, we can look at the switch infrastructure and monitoring um, to start taking kind of uh, net flow or PCAPs, things like that. We can look at the proxy servers, the jump hosts, um, to see uh, what logs are on these systems to identify if there's been people accessing it without our awareness or at, at strange times, things like that. Next slide, please. Um, so, and now our hunt book uh, may look something like this, where we have a number of tests and validators to identify suspicious connections from that vendor and engineering network. So we want to look at specific um, logs, PCAPs, uh, ACL, um, switch infrastructure, uh, we want to identify suspicious behavior. So we may actually identify that um, there's been some kind of scanning activity coming through that vendor network. Um, it may be kind of uh, internal enumeration, which is quite common in a um, early stage attack. Um, we want to identify whether there's been suspicious protocols or services. Um, there could have been things like uh, data exfiltration. We might find that SSH is coming over invalid ports, like what happened in the TRISIS scenario. Um, so in, in order to uh, hide uh, infrastructure and services, it's quite common to move these kind of things on, on different ports and things like that. Um, and then we may also want to look at high risk communication. So maybe there'll be specific functions like um, firmware modification on controllers, the safety logic uh, on these controllers or uh, program changes, things like that. Um, this, this really does require a, a deep understanding of uh, industrial protocols, um, sometimes bespoke and proprietary protocols, which is quite difficult. Um, however, if, we, if we're not looking at it, we're potentially missing um, some really high risk communications. Uh, another source here is really looking at controller logs to identify whether um, unexpected activities occurred on our safety controllers and uh, our plant controllers. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so the, the last uh, scenario is really looking at the, the domain expertise driven threat hunting. So domain expertise uh, hunts are, are really kind of leveraging uh, knowledge that we've identified in previous incidents, previous hunts, uh, information that's been shared with us. Um, so our scenarios and our situational awareness and intelligence that we've identified and been provided from previous uh, incidents may no longer be relevant. Um, so the indicators are no longer valid. Um, however, the scenarios and the TTPs may still be valid. Um, it's really the knowledge that's been shaping us uh, as hunters 
uh, and we take that knowledge and identify um, specific hunts to our environment. So it's a little bit of an overlap of all, all, all the previous scenarios. Next slide, please. So as an example here, um, this is a, a, a way we can look at uh, operational issues that I had already mentioned earlier. Um, this is something that uh, brings home with me because it's something that uh, really kicked off a hunt for us in Saudi Arabia. Um, so we identified a number of issues within a plant environment that was um, kind of occurring with safety controllers that were rebooting with um, uh, unexpected cause. Um, so this kicked off a, a hunt scenario for us. So it's kind of a hybrid hunt investigation, um, looking at suspicious or interesting events within the environments. Um, and then, uh, yeah, conducting hunts on, on previous experiences. Sorry, next slide. So in the TRISA scenario, we had uh, this uh, safety controller, so Triconic safety controller on the right there. We, we had a number of uh, reboots that were causing the plant to shut down. Um, it was originally investigated as a malfunctioning controller. Um, we actually have intelligence that initially I thought it was uh, two times that the plant was shut down, but we have uh, more information now that it was at least two times. So it's likely that there was a third shutdown of the plant. Um, you're talking about a week each time and you know, potentially hundreds of millions of dollars each shutdown. So quite significant. Um, this is a very, very uh, well reported incidents. Um, there's a lot of people talking about this, a huge amount of intelligence. Um, Dragos is huge write-ups on both this incident and uh, Xenotime, the threat actor that um, is uh, known for doing the incident. So taking this information now, we know that potentially we don't have Triconics controllers in our plant. Um, we don't have an active campaign of uh, Xenotime targeting us, um, but what can we learn from this scenario and what can we leverage um, to create our own domain expertise hunt? Uh, next, next slide, please. So um, while we may not have uh, Triconics controllers in our plants, um, there's a huge amount of safety systems and safety infrastructure that are, um, are out there. Um, for example, the Delta V uh, logic solvers, Alan um, Bradley uh, guard PLCs. There's a huge amount that we can take away and learn and look at for our environment. Um, so we're taking these techniques that were leveraged by Xenotime uh, in these attacks um, and focusing on our environment and different targets that could be present. Next slide, please. So taking that and, and uh, a scenario here might be that we are experiencing operational issues. Um, this, this could be something that we have in our plants. It could be we are experiencing unexpected shutdowns. Uh, it could also just be that we're doing a periodic hunt um, for um, this activity based on what we've learned from uh, these previous uh, incidents. Um, so the context really is that we're ex either experiencing operational regularity, irregularities or um, we're doing a periodic hunt um, based on previous intel. So our hypothesis is that an adversary has compromised the plant safety engineering workstation and is leveraging the system to conduct unauthorized activities on the safety controllers. Next slide, please. So from our previous intelligence and knowledge, we can also trace the um, adversary's uh, attack path through the environment. We know a number of capabilities and, and TTPs that were leveraged by the adversary, including VPN access, RDP access, um, through to the engineering workstations and then a number of scenarios that the tools that were leveraged and uh, Python scripts and things like that to trigger uh, cores on the controllers. Next slide. So from this, uh, after having generated our workbook, we may continue um, to generate our tests, um, including identifying suspicious connections to engineering workstations, identifying file creations and executions on the engineering workstations uh, and unexpected uh, behavior on the safety controllers. Um, so a number of different collections we can look at, uh, a lot of things on the DMZ, the firewall, plant infrastructure, um, ACL uh, records, uh, PCAPs, uh, engineering workstation logs, this is quite a lot we can look at. Um, and then we can also go down to some kind of hybrid uh, forensic collection. So we may do triage data collection on our um, engineering workstations, such as gathering uh, file tables, shell bags, registry hives, things like that. Um, all, all good for investigation and hunts. Um, finally, we may, may look at the actual controllers themselves uh, by pulling controller logs or engineering application logs. Next slide, please. So um, it's kind of the overview of the scenarios and how you can generate these hypotheses. Um, what do you do at the end of this? Um, 
ideally we want to document our findings in workbooks and reports, even if we don't find anything. Um, the information that we gain from these can be used to generate future hunts. Um, the information can also be used to uh, improve our environments. Um, obviously, if we find any associated act threat activity, we probably want to take that and generate uh, or kick off an incident response, uh, incident response activities. We may be transla uh, transitioning from the hunt team to an IR team. Um, however, uh, that may be another phase that we kick off. Uh, we want to look at our environmental findings. Will we actually able to achieve our objectives? Will we able to pull the logs we need for these scenarios? Uh, is there better ways we can operationalize uh, this information, centralizing our logs, um, improving collections? Um, or can we even improve defenses? Will we be able to identify things like uh, uh, lack of controls, lack of segregation, things like that, that we can improve our environment and feed into the engineering and uh, operations teams? Uh, and then finally, can we can we automate this stuff? Can we can we streamline these hunts um, and make them repeatable? Like we can take a monthly hunt, and turn it into a daily hunt if we can automate it, um, or we can actually take this information and feed it directly into our security operations center um, and let them monitor it on a daily basis. Um, so what we take here is really important, and uh, it really gives us the uh, value out of our hunt. So I believe that's actually a wrap for my talk. Um, I'm happy to move on to some questions if there are any in the queue. Are there any resources, for example, hunts and hypotheses specific to do with OT and ICS? Um, so, I mean, Dragos has a, a lot of information on our website. Uh, Hunts are generally kind of created based on your your environment. Um, so having you know these these scenarios and how you can generate these is uh, um, it, it's a tool to enable you to to create your own hunts. Um, yeah. What else we got, Warren? We've got uh, how important is developing primary intelligence requirements before conducting cyber threat hunts from uh, Curtis. Yep. Um, so primary intelligence, uh, I mean, it's, it's definitely an enabler for your hunting um, activities. It's, it's definitely a way you can leverage um, for uh, generating hypotheses for hunts. Um, however, it's not necessarily required for hunting. Um, there's definitely other scenarios you can establish to conduct hunts within your environment that uh, you know, looks at specific you know, situational awareness. You understand your environment, you understand the segregation points. Um, you may just want to look at uh, things like uh, what's traversing my firewall into the DMZ um, and doing things that's looking for kind of the unknowns. Um, while the security operations centers are looking for things that we know about, basically, they're kind of looking for the known um, TTPs, the known information, but we're not looking for the unknowns. Um, so that's where hunting kind of gets in there and, and looks at uh, things that aren't triggering our threat intelligence feeds. We're not triggering IOCs and TTPs where we're, we're, we're seeing something new. That's that's why we're trying to add value. Uh, oh, hello, Peter from New Zealand. Uh, could you comment on a threat hunt for an insider threat scenario? I understand you couldn't rule this out in the early stages of a crisis. Yeah, good question, Peter. Is that a stage um, question, you guys? <laughs> <laughs> I definitely fed him that one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, good question, Peter. Um, uh, in in the crisis scenario, and it, it, again, it will be um, dependent on your your specific environment. Um, in crisis, we we identified um, the control system environment didn't have really good control over USB media. Um, so USB media was a potential uh, infection vector that we looked at the, at the initial scenario. So we were pulling um, registry records and logs that could identify when um, media was connected uh, and where it was uh, going around the plant, things like that. So um, that was a scenario that we needed to look at. Um, in that scenario, we also had a number of, uh, most of the environment was leveraging shared accounts. Um, Traditionally, a lot of uh, OT and ICS environments are leveraging things like you know, just the administrator accounts or an account called operator or something like that. So tracing user activity through the environment is difficult. Um, so it is uh, difficult in those scenarios and highly recommended to go down to actually user account level, um, uh, user, user based account. So identifying when a USB has been connected um, and which user is actually on that machine is helpful. Um, if it's just using a generic account, it makes it difficult and we may need to go down to 
uh, who was even in the plants at the time, who was scheduled on, do we have any engineers or any vendors within the plant environment, um, things like that. So, yeah, that, that's that's one of the scenarios that we were looking at, definitely. If it was a, a inside user that was uh, connecting USB media and copying data into the uh, engineering workstations. And Julian, you didn't do this one, did you? If the data isn't being already collected in a log solution, how do you approach the OT, ICS teams letting the threat hunters collect information, running scripts and executables in the OT environment? Is it just this a relationship? Is, yeah, yeah. It, it is. I mean, it's it's the first, uh, I think my first slide was gain trust. Um, so it, it's, it's a scenario of baby steps. We kind of need to show what our value is to these, these uh, operators and engineers and really help them out. We don't want to impact their kind of operations by doing this kind of stuff. Maybe what we can do is wait for specific maintenance windows where we know that um, the, the plant's in a, a shutdown state or they're doing some kind of um, you know system upgrades or something like that. So we can take up uh, advantage of those opportunities and ask them, hey, you know, while you've got the system down, can you take these logs? Um, can you do a PCAT for us? All this kind of stuff. So leveraging the expertise. So a lot of the data collection um, may not actually be achieved by yourself. Uh, it may be achieved by um, the operators. It may be you just ask them what data they need to provide you and they have a level of confidence that they're not going to screw up their system. You know, they don't know the IT guy coming in here that may be um, running some scripts and stuff, but if you told them, hey, just run these commands you know, and pull this data for me, um, it may help out in, in terms of getting them a bit more comfortable with what you've got. And you know, over time, when you build and establish that relationship, um, they'll be more comfortable with allowing you to do certain activities. No, uh, and is there any threat hunting framework which should be followed and you can measure your maturity against? Um, yeah, th there are a number of frameworks. Uh, they are covered in the five-day class that we, we talk about, but um, Dragos has a number of uh, really good resources. If you go to our website, um, there is a, a hunt maturity models uh, as well as uh, enablers that you can leverage uh, from there. I, I won't cover it too much here, but um, there is definitely materials you can use. Oh, a late run on questions here. Uh, should threat hunting always be conducted regardless of the maturity of central logging and real-time monitoring with OT, within OT environments? Um, it's, it, it is an enabler. It's a, it's a tool that you can leverage. Um, if you have limited resources within your OT security team, it's probably not the first thing you want to focus on. Um, you know, there is a, um, another model and probably available on Dragos's website, otherwise, um, uh, definitely available online and through SANS, but uh, it's the sliding scale of uh, security. And basically what this, this talks about is the value versus the uh, efforts um, that you obtain from specific activities, um, the cost and the value, effort of, of specific activities. So on um, one side of the scale, you have a huge amount of value and um, a, a le lower level of effort, such as looking at um, architecture of your environment, um, making sure that you're, you're securing the communication flows to your environment. Um, huge amount of value. Um, effort is a little bit lower than ongoing activities like threat hunting and um, huge amount of data to churn through, things like that, which that'll be on the other side of the scale where we have a, a high level of effort. However, the value may not be the same. So if you are um, focusing on, or if you're facing constrained resources, definitely focus on, on the side of the scale that's going to give you the most um, benefit, um, which would be the architecture, establishing your monitoring, establishing your capabilities. Um, once we've established capabilities and we're looking at you know, ongoing real-time monitoring, then we can start looking for things that we're not expecting, um, where hunting is, is comes in. Definitely going to get value from hunting if you have um, time. Like As I was mentioning before, you could have these kind of hybrid models where you have um, your hunt team or your, your security team does you know, um, nine full days of work on looking at architecture and establishing um, foundations for your security practice. And then one day of the week or one day of the fortnight, um, they focus on doing hunt activities. Um, it's kind of supplemental and, and beneficial, and it's also fun. It, it's it's entertaining looking through this stuff and looking for adversary behavior. Um, it also gives you a really good uh, understanding of your environment. Um, so, definitely recommend doing that kind of uh, that kind of approach. All right, and I think this will be uh, lucky last uh, from Gavin. Although both would be ideal from an ICS slash OT perspective. Would network threat hunting skills be better than host in terms of upskilling? Um, 
I, I guess if you're going to start off, um, network is a good place to start. Um, understanding your environment, understanding um, where the communication flows are, what normal looks like with your environment is is, is beneficial. Um, networking also, um, it, it really gives you the pivot point to uh, continue your hunts within an environment. So for example, if we're looking at uh, DMZ infrastructure and we start looking at the communication flows that are going through our DMZ, um, looking at NetFlow, looking at firewall logs, uh, looking at PCAP data, things like that. If we identify unexpected traffic like a, a, a VPN connection, an IDP connection or something like that to a specific host, we can pivot and we can go well, what's on that host and we can hand over to somebody else to do that you know, host-based analysis. Um, so it, it is definitely beneficial to, um, I mean, it, it's good to have a hybrid team where you have uh, one guy that may be focused on specific network communications and another guy that's focused on um, looking at uh, host-based evidence and things like that. Definitely beneficial. As a starting point, network is, is a good place to start. It gives you um, assurance of what you're looking at, what you're, what's communicating on your environment. That's great. That's it for the questions. Uh, and look at that. We're actually ahead of time. I think people will get 15 minutes of their lives back. Um, so look, a big thank you to our presenters today, um, to the guys in the US. Thanks for staying up. Uh, and even even good folks on the sidelines like uh, Curtis and Linda. I know you've, you've been there sitting through a, a few hours with us. Um, to all you that registered and attended, thank you. Uh, to Ben and the EIG, um, it was your idea to, to have this in the first place. So uh, thank you for that. To all the attendees also, we will send a link of the recordings and also PDFs of the slides. So I just want to say thanks again. If there's anything you require of, uh, of me or us, please reach out. Um, it's wmeekle at dragos.com or it's sales at Dragos, it's Intel at Dragos, or it's Toc at, at Dragos. So I'm um, happy to field any follow-up questions and uh, talk, to, talk to you a bit later. Thank you again for joining. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day.